Welcome, colleagues, to the third day of our first annual Onco Alert Colloquium. Along with our partners of MASC, SEOG, eCancer, and VG Oncology, we bring you this first of its kind year in review of some of the biggest news in oncology for 2020 divided by tumor group. Onco Alert is an oncology network of medical, surgical, radiation oncologists, oncology nurses, cancer researchers, and most importantly, patient advocates who fight cancer through the spread of reliable scientific information regarding cancer and cancer treatments, fortifying the voice of our patients and the promotion and creation of oncology education that is accessible to all. Our goal with this colloquium is to provide our colleagues with a reliable year in review by some of our Oncolor faculty who are also leaders in their field. This colloquium, like every Oncolor initiative, is without sponsorship. Everything you will see this week is possible because of the dedication of our Oncolor faculty and friends who believe that as colleagues, we can make a difference in global education, regardless of financial possibilities. As you have noticed, there is no signing up, there's no registration, and these videos are, will always be found on our YouTube channel where the links can be easily shared and we encourage you to do so. Today's presentations are the best of 2020 in breast cancer. Today's presenters are Dr. Erica Hamilton of Sarah Cannon Cancer Institute, Advanced Hormone Receptor Positive, HER2 Positive Breast Cancer, Dr. Matteo Lambertini from the University of Geneva, Early Hormone Receptor Positive, HER2 Positive Breast Cancer, Ms. Julia Maues and Ms. Maya McCarmo from GRASP and Tiger Lily Foundation on what the year of cancer research has meant to the patient advocate. Dr. Hope Rugo from the University of California, San Francisco, Advanced Triple Negative Breast Cancer, Dr. Sarah Tulaney of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Early Triple Negative Breast Cancer, and Dr. Ikro Miatini from the University of Florence on breast cancer radiotherapy. We hope you enjoy this colloquium and invite you to join us for day four, where we'll be going through the best of 2020 in ovarian cancer, sarcomas, lymphomas, immunotherapies, and liquid biopsies. Without further delay, Dr. Hamilton. I'm Dr. Erica Hamilton, and I lead the Breast Cancer Research Program for Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. On behalf of OncoAlert, I'm happy to share with you the highlights of the year in metastatic breast cancer for hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative tumors. My disclosure slide is here to say that I participate in a lot of clinical trials and panels, but all funds are institutional only. I take no personal funds from pharma. So let's start with HER2 positive metastatic disease. So this past year was a great year, rivaling 2013, where we saw approval of both TDM1 and pertuzumab in the same year. December 2019, we received approval for trastuzumab deruxtecan, and at the very beginning of 2020, we received approval for tecatinib. You all are very um, likely to be familiar with this, showing the mechanism of action of trastuzumab deruxtecan or TDXD. It's an antibody drug conjugate, not unlike TDM1, but there's some important differentiation. First, its payload is a topoisomerase inhibitor, not a tubulin drug like TDM1. Second, it carries more payloads per molecule for a higher DAR or drug to antibody ratio, or seven to eight compared to just three to four with TDM1. Third, it also has some bystander effect, meaning that even if there are cells surrounding that don't have good HER2 expression, it can kill these cells as it's membrane permeable. This is the Destiny Bresto 1 study, and we're well familiar with this, where they have pulled all the patients in green here, treated at 5.4 milligrams per kilogram, or the recommended dose for the subsequent analyses. This is the updated data presented at San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in 2020 by Dr. Modi. The overall response rate remained very similar at 61.4%, but the median duration of response has lengthened from 14.8 months to 20.8 months. Additionally, progression-free survival has also increased from 16.4 months presented last summer to 19.4 months in this 2020 analysis. Besides the progression-free survival of 19.4 months, what may be even more impressive is we are now seeing a median overall survival of 24 months. So two years with these patients with a median of six priors in the metastatic setting. And this is actually quite immature data with only 35% of patients accounted for. The most common adverse events were nausea, fatigue, alopecia, 
and some neutropenia based on this update from 2019. The adverse event we've all been watching and most concerned with is pneumonitis or ILD. And over 13%, 13.6% of the population when we looked in 2019. It's now a bit higher, around 15%, but fatal grade five cases remaining pretty consistent in the two to 3% range. In this analysis on the bottom, we see that the risk of adjudicated drug-related ILD appears lower after approximately 12 months on treatment, suggesting that this risk of developing ILD is not related to cumulative dose of TDXD. We need to pay close attention to our pulmonary symptoms and educate our patients on what to bring to our attention. So let's move to HER2 climb. This was the study design. Patients had metastatic HER2 driven breast cancer and had already seen trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and TDM1. 612 patients were randomized in a two to one fashion to capecitabine trastuzumab with tacatinib versus capecitabine trastuzumab with placebo. In addition to the commonly allowed population of patients with brain mets that were treated and stable, HER2 climb also allowed patients who had untreated brain mets and those that were treated and subsequently progressed. So a very high risk brain met population here on entry. Here you see the primary results of HER2 climb. The study met all of its endpoints, PFS, OS, overall response rate, PFS and brain meds, and overall survival in brain meds. This data led to the approval of tacatinib on April the 17th, 2020, in the setting of at least one prior anti-HER2 therapy, and again is improved in combination with capecitabine and trastuzumab. This is the change in tumor size on tacatinib arm regardless of the presence or absence of brain metastases. So actually quite an impressive waterfall plot here. Here you can see the adverse event profiles for both arms. Diarrhea and hand foot syndrome from capecitabine were the most common side effects, numerically higher in the tacatinib arms, but this really appears to be for longer treatment with capecitabine. In other words, tacatinib itself doesn't cause hand foot. It's the increased exposure from capecitabine that makes this a little bit higher. What we do see that is higher with tacatinib is AST, ALT increase all the way on the far right side of the graph. It's infrequent, but this can be caused by both tacatinib and capecitabine. So let's turn to just brain metastases for a minute. On the left, this is the curve for the 48% of patients on study that had some form of brain metastases, whether these were treated stable, untreated, or treated and progressive. Hazard ratio is 0.32 with a 5.7 month improvement in progression-free survival. And on the right is the subset of active brain metastases, so those that were untreated or treated and subsequently stable, with again, 5.4 month improvement in progression-free survival for a hazard ratio here of 0.36. Here's the overall survival just with those patients with brain metastases presented at ASCO this year by Dr. Lin, a hazard ratio of about 0.5 with six and 9.1 months benefit in survival. Very clinically meaningful in patients with such a poor prognosis. At San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, the results for all endpoints were broken down by hormone receptor status. Here, you can see progression-free survival being improved regardless of whether patients were hormone receptor positive on the left or hormone receptor negative on the right. Here are some ongoing studies with trastuzumab deruxtecan as well as tacatinib that I'm very excited to see and I'm confident that it will have us using the agents earlier soon. We have metastatic comparisons of TDM1 alone with either the addition of tacatinib or versus trastuzumab deruxtecan. We have evaluation of tricatinib in leptomeningeal disease, high unmet clinical need, and we also have combinations with trastuzumab deruxtecan with checkpoint inhibitors, et cetera. I'm not going to torture any of you by completely reading through this slide, but I really just wanted to show that tricatinib and trastuzumab deruxtecan aren't it. There's a deep portfolio of novel HER2 agents in clinical trials now from tyrosine kinase inhibitors to bispecifics, and these include both HER2, HER family receptors, such as HER2 with HER3, et cetera, and to even the HER family with immune uh, secondaries. We also have antibody drug conjugates, and you see a deep pipeline here, as well as novel mechanisms, including the immune system, such as a HER2, PD-1 bispecific, and vaccines, et cetera. Okay, so let's move our focus to hormone receptor positive advanced breast cancer. 
multiple randomized trials have shown us that AIs in combination with CDK4-6 inhibitors consistently give first-line patients a progression-free survival between 25 to 28 months, which is significantly longer than AI alone. We have steadily been searching for biomarkers to predict if there's populations that don't benefit from CDK4-6 as much. From individual trial analyses to the FDA pooled analysis, we really haven't found a whole lot. At San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium this year, Alex Pratt presented a pooled analysis of Mona Lisa trials 2, 3, and 7 by intrinsic type. He showed that not surprisingly, luminal breast cancer has the best prognosis and in placebo basal and HER2 enriched the worst. What's very interesting here though, is that in placebo, basal and HER2 enriched does the worst, but for ribocyclob added, the HER2 enriched population approaches the luminal outcomes. So a fantastic relative benefit there. Looking at this another way, progression-free survival benefit is seen in all subtypes except for basal. Luminal B and HER2 derive the most benefit, although luminal A does derive benefit as well, but is the best prognosis with or without CDK4-6. So let's move more towards endocrine agents as backbones. This was PARS a full study design presented by Dr. Lombard Cusack at ASCO this year. These patients were untreated in the metastatic setting, but could have received endocrine therapy adjuvantly if relapse was at least 12 months from cessation of endocrine therapy. On the bottom, you can see that 40% of patients on both arms received chemotherapy in the early stage setting, and about 25% or a quarter had seen prior aromatase inhibitor for early stage disease. Fulvestrate plus palbociclib was not statistically superior to letrozole plus palbociclib as first-line therapy for hormone receptor-positive metastatic breast cancer. And in fact, numerically, letrozole came out about four months better, better at 32 months progression-free survival. So despite what we know about single agents, fulvestrant versus aromatase inhibitors in the first line setting, this superiority does not hold true with the addition of CDK4-6 inhibitors. And in fact, numerically, letrozole comes out a little bit ahead. As you can see, although both of these analyses crossed one, so were not statistically significant, there was a trend for those without prior AI doing better on aromatase inhibitors as opposed to fulvestrant and a suggestion among the 25% of patients that had had prior AI that maybe fulvestrant was a little bit better. We know that ESR1 mutations have a low frequency in primary tumors, about 1%, and low frequency in first-line metastatic disease at about 4 to 5%. But among refractory, metastatic, hormonally-driven tumors, this is much higher in the order of 25 to 50%. In PADA1, presented by Dr. Bedard at ASCO this year, they evaluated the prognostic impact of ESR1 mutations in patients treated with AI and palbociclib in the first-line metastatic setting. Ultimately, in this trial, they went on to see whether a switch strategy to fulvestrant was superior for patients who developed an ESR1 mutation. But here they report, just on the first part of the analysis, those patients with ESR1 mutations detected at the beginning of therapy and how they fared on AI plus palbociclib. Not surprisingly, the patients with ESR1 mutations at the start of therapy, which was 33 patients or 3% of the population, receiving AI plus palbociclib fare significantly worse with a median progression-free survival of only 11 months compared to 26.7 months for those patients without ESR1 mutations. However, 23 of the 33 patients or 69%, two thirds, with ESR1 mutations at baseline cleared these mutations by one month on therapy with a CDK4-6 inhibitor in combination with AI. And for those patients that clear their ESR1 mutation with AI plus palbociclib, they go on to have an outcome on par with the ESR1 wild type majority with a progression free survival here of 24 months compared to only 7.4 months for those who do not clear it. This is Believe, presented at ASCO 2020 by Dr. Rugo, and informs us of a big issue in hormone receptor positive disease right now. What is the activity of our approved regimens post CDK4-6? Here, we looked at the Solar-1 regimen of fulvestrant with alpha-lysib. And what we saw was a progression-free survival of 7.4 months, an overall response rate of 50%, and 50% of patients with progressive disease at six months, so still retains good activity for those with PI3 kinase mutations. 
This cohort presented at San Antonio Breast this year looked at patients who had progressed on CDK4-6 with fulvestrin backbone as their last treatment. And so instead of getting fulvestrin alpalisib, they received letrozole alpalisib. Here, the efficacy of alpalisib with letrozole was demonstrated despite over 80% of these patients progressing on prior AI. So this is tessataxel. It was presented at San Antonio this year. It's a novel oral taxane with a half-life of over one week. And so it's dosed only once per cycle. In the Contessa trial, patients were randomized to Cape Cytobine, 1,250 milligrams per meter squared BID, two weeks on, one week off every 21 days, or Cape Cytobine at 825 milligrams per meter squared BID, two weeks on, one week off, with tessataxel at 27 milligrams per meter squared orally on day one of the cycle. Progression-free survival was improved from 6.9 to 9.8 months with the addition of tessataxel to Cape Cytobine with a hazard ratio of 0.72. Unfortunately, here is the adverse event profile. Neutropenia was significantly higher in the combo arm at about a third grade three and a third grade four neutropenia compared to only 7% grade three neutropenia alone with Cape Cytobine. Also higher was grade 3-4 febron neutropenia at about 10%, grade 3-4 anemia, diarrhea, nausea, and neuropathy. Hand foot was less frequent with grade 3-4 at only 6% instead of 12% with Cape Cytobine alone at the higher dose. Really, this appears significantly tougher for those with metastatic breast cancer to tolerate the doublet for only a couple months change in progression-free survival. So what is on the horizon for ER-positive breast cancer? SIRDs, SIRMs, SARVs, and CIRCAs seem to be the biggest class of agents, so far with results showing pretty impressive progression-free survival and clinical benefit rate post-CDK4-6 inhibitors. Here is some data on a CIRCA and a SIRD presented at San Antonio Breast. On the left is H3 Bio CIRCA. 41% had four or more prior lines of therapy, 71% had seen fulvestrin. At the 450 milligram dosing, we see an overall response rate of about 15% and a clinical benefit rate defined as CR, PR, and stable disease of at least 23 weeks duration of 33%. There were subset analyses that those with clonal ESR1 or those with progesterone receptor positivity derived even more benefit. Similar in efficacy was Sanofi CERD. 50% had three or more lines of therapy. 50% received prior CERD, and the overall response rate was 8.5%, and the clinical benefit rate was 33%. These compounds are quite likely to come onto the stage in many different settings. Also with a lot of interest is the AKT inhibitors. We did see negative AKT data at San Antonio Breast this year for triple negative breast cancer, but data has been promising so far here in combination with fulvestrin with both apatisertib and capivasertib. And finally, we move to the antibody drug conjugates. We have recently seen the approval of sasituzumab gabapentin for triple negative breast cancer, and it is now under evaluation for hormone receptor positive disease, and we anticipate to see a readout of that trial shortly. As well as we also see trastuzumab deruxtecan for HER2 low with an impressive response rate. Thank you so much on behalf of Oncolert for learning with us about metastatic breast cancer. Dear friends and colleagues, my name is Matteo Lambertini. I'm a medical oncologist from the University of Genova San Martino Hospital in Genova, Italy. And it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be part of this Oncolert event. And I wish to thank my friend Dean Morgan and the Oncolert Network for making this, uh, this possible. My task is to review the most important updates uh, in 2020 uh, on hormone receptor positive and the HER2 positive early breast cancer. So focusing on the early and advanced setting. I will first start with the HER2 positive disease, moving then to the hormone receptor positive disease, and we'll uh, 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 conclude the presentation with a, a few uh, uh, recent data in the survivorship uh, care plan. Starting with the HER2 positive subtypes, this is uh, where we are, or actually where we have been for several years now, 
the uh, standard of care in this setting, in the early setting, adjuvant and adjuvant treatment has been for many years, anthracycline plus taxane-based chemotherapy with trastuzumab for a year. As you can see from this cartoon, over the past year, there has been several trials that have tried to address the possibility to escalate the treatment, so, so to make the treatment more effective, to rescue more people, and other, uh, other uh, trials that have tried to de-escalate the treatment, to try to have the same efficacy, but with less toxicity. In this regards, important data from the, in, in 2019 has been the Catherine trial uh, that has led to the approval of TDM1 as standard of care as post-neoadjuvant treatment in patients without pathologic complete response after a standard neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus uh, anti 2 therapy, as well as data from the Extenet and Affinity uh, trial. On the other side, in terms of de-escalation, the most successful uh, uh, strategy are to those trying to de-escalate the chemotherapy backbone. And among them, the APT regimen, the so-called Tolani regimen, that has, uh, that has led to the use, the current use in clinical practice of the combination of weekly pachytaxel, pratsasuzumab for a year in patients with low risk, as adjuvant treatment in patients with low risk, HER2 positive disease. In 2020, we had the presentation of two important trials uh, in these regards. One, the TRAIN2 de-escalating effort to reduce the burden of anthracycline-based chemotherapy, and the other, the Caitlin trial to reduce the burden of chemotherapy, removing the taxane portion, but increasing, so escalating the uh, anti 2 treatment with the combination of Pertuso and TDM1. I will start with the TRAIN2 trial. A trial in patients with HER2-positive breast cancer, stage 2 and 3 disease, more than 400 women that were randomized, more than 60% of patients with node-positive disease, and more than half of the patients included with hormone receptor-positive, HER2-positive disease. In this trial, patients received in the neoadjuvant setting, all of them, dual anti-HER2 blockade, trastuzumab and pertuzumab, and the randomization was, was between two different chemotherapy uh, regimens, the first one, the, the uh, uh, standard regimen with anthracycline and taxane-based chemotherapy, three cycle of FEC followed by six cycle of paclitaxel plus carboplatin given on a, 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 a regimen at day one and day eight for six cycle, meaning 12 total administration of these drugs. The experimental arm without anthracycline was nine cycles of day one, eight, Paclitaxel and carboplatin, meaning uh, 18 total administration of paclitaxel plus carboplatin. Back in 2018, the authors have presented and published in the Lancet Oncology the results in terms of PCR, suggesting no difference between the two treatment regimens. Similar PCR, uh, PCR rates, more than 65% in both uh, patient treated uh, in the anthracycline free and anthracycline based chemotherapy regimen. At the recent ASCO conference, the authors have presented the uh, much awaited survival results from this trial, suggesting no difference in event free survival nor in overall survival between patients that receive dual anti 2 blockade with uh, taxane and carboplatin without anthracycline or with anthracycline plus taxane plus carboplatin based chemotherapy. And the authors have also looked into the subgroups, uh, trying to see if there was a signal for a more effective. Uh, more, more effective uh, favoring anthracycline for the highest risk patient population. However, apparently there was no benefit irrespective of nodal status also in patients with no, no two, uh, with N2 or N3 clinical uh, stage at the time of diagnosis. Results from this trial are intriguing and are suggesting that probably also some patients with higher risk to positive breast cancer can be spared the toxicity of anthracyclines. However, before considering the possibility to remove anthracycline uh, from all patients with to positive disease, I think we need more research in this, uh, in this regards. And I will go back to this point in the final part of this, of this section of the presentation. Also, considering that in this trial, the anthracycline-free regimen was 18 cycles of paclitaxel and carboplatin, which is a regimen that is not currently used in clinical practice and uh, with its uh, side effects. The other trial uh, uh, presented in 2020 at the ASCO conference was the Caitlin trial. In this study was an adjuvant trial 
Uh, that included patients at higher risk of this recurrence, so those patients that in these days we normally treat with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. However, this was an adjuvant study, including patients with stage 2, stage 3, uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, mostly not positive, only 10% of the patients were non negative, and uh, all patients received 3 4 cycle of anthracycline based chemotherapy. And then the, uh, uh, the randomization was to receive taxane plus dual anti R2 blockade following anthracycline based chemotherapy, or to remove the taxane chemotherapy portion and to uh, substitute uh, the taxane with a combination of TDM1 plus pertuzumab. The trial did not meet its primary endpoint, showing no difference in disease, in invasive disease free survival between these two treatment regimens in both the not positive population, so the primary endpoint of the trial, as well as in the intention to treat population. Suggesting that this is probably not the best strategy to try to remove the uh, and to de escalate the chemotherapy burden. So, this is our uh, current algorithm for the majority of patients with HER2 positive disease. On one side, we have patients at low risk, stage one, less than two centimeter, uh, node negative, clinical non negative, that are candidates to surgery first, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy with paclitaxel, weekly paclitaxel alone, and trastuzumab for a year, the Tolani regimen. For patients at higher risk of disease recurrence, so patients with node positive disease, any T stage, or patients with tumor more than two centimeter, irrespective of nodal status, we now tend to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, neoadjuvant treatment, and the neoadjuvant treatment is chemotherapy, taxane based chemotherapy with or without anthracycline, plus dual anti R2 blockade, trastuzumab and pertuzumab. For patients achieving a pathologic complete response with this neoadjuvant regimen, uh, we will continue with the same uh, anti R2 treatment uh, uh, or dropping pertuzumab in patients that were not at particularly high risk at the time of diagnosis. For the non PCR uh, group, the current standard of care is use of adjuvant TDM1. The important question that we have in these days is how we can de-escalate the chemotherapy burden, so when is really safe to remove the anthracycline portion of chemotherapy. The Dafton trial recently presented at the uh, San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium has, has tried to address uh, the PCR rates with a kind of uh, strong Tolani regimen, meaning 12 weeks of uh, paclitaxel with trastuzumab, but adding also pertuzumab in the neoadjuvant phase. With this regimen, more than 50%, actually almost 57% of the patient achieved a pathologic complete response with this, with this regimen, page, patient with stage 2 and 3 uh, disease. And in patients with pathologic complete response, almost all of them did not receive further chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. If this regimen is safe also in survival, uh, also in terms of survival outcomes, uh, we have to wait for the COMPASS HER2 uh, trials that are currently addressing this question in a much larger patient population, including more than 1,200 patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. However, we have to keep in mind that when we de-escalate a treatment, de-escalate of course, it's something positive in terms of side effects and potential long-term side effects, but this is something negative in terms of higher risk of disease recurrence. And that the recent San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, a, a very pro, a provoking abstract, has suggested that almost half of, uh, of patients with this disease are actually not interested in a de-escalated uh, clinical trial with fear of recurrence being one of the main reasons for, uh, for this lack of interest in de-escalation trials. So the main take-home message from this study is that we really need to, uh, to perform de-escalation de efforts that are the safest possible for our patients. So we need to better select who are the patients that are potentially candidates to this, to this regimen. There are two potential strategies. The first one is, the, is using molecular imaging, like uh, PET-FDG. Try to select those patients that are uh, uh, better suitable for, uh, for this de-escalated regimen, and this was the peer gain trial presented at TASCO as try to do. In this trial, a patient received with her 2 positive breast cancer, stage 1 to 3A uh, disease, received two cycles, of treatment before uh, a PET at baseline, two cycles of treatment, and then another PET, and then a further neoadjuvant treatment before uh, undergoing surgery. In ARMA, patient received two cycles of uh, chemotherapy 
a, a TCH, so chemotherapy, a, a docetaxel, carboplatin, a trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. In, in RB, this patient, the patient received only a dual anti R2 blockade, pertuzumab and trastuzumab with endocrine therapy for those patients with hormone receptor positive disease. In RMA, irrespective of the results uh, at the time of PET, patient uh, received further four cycles of TCHP regimen. In RB, after uh, uh, the uh, second PET, based on the response on PET, patients were, were, uh, uh, were candidates to receive further six cycles of uh, dual anti tube blockade alone without chemotherapy if they had a response uh, with the PET with this PET after two cycles, in patients without response, they were switched to six cycles of TCHP regimen. So what this trial wants to investigate is if the PET after two cycles of treatment was able to select patients that may be spared chemotherapy and can receive only anti-R2 treatment alone. These are the first results from the trial only on PCR rates, suggesting that the, the majority of patients in, in RB, so those receiving um, pertuzumab and trastuzumab alone or with endocrine therapy, so without chemotherapy. 80% of them had a PET response after two cycles. And in this patient, there was a very promising PCR rates with almost 40% of the patient, 38% of the patient that achieved the PCR. If we compare RB and RMA, we can see more PCR in the chemotherapy, uh, in the chemotherapy arm. However, uh, the PCR rates in a PET responder is promising and need to be further investigated. And we need to wait for the survival outcomes from this trial. Another poten po potential uh, um, approach to uh, de-escalate in a safer way the uh, chemotherapy backbone could be to uh, integrate clinical data and genomic data. And this is what the group of Alex Pratt has tried to do with the uh, so-called R2DX, which is a, a, a measure of different uh, clinical uh, pathological features together with uh, genomic, genomic data and to try to understand who are those patients that are uh, less likely to relapse and that can be uh, more suitable for a de-escalated chemotherapy approach in this setting. Moving to the hormone receptor positive uh, early breast cancer setting, I will mostly focus on the adjuvant setting and the CDK46 inhibitor trials. This is important to try to escalate the treatment uh, for some selected patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer because we know that despite the, uh, uh, the major benefit that we have from the currently available uh, adjuvant endocrine options, so tamoxifen and aroma inhibitor with or without ovarian function suppression in premenopausal women. Still, patient at, uh, can relapse also at long term, uh, also beyond five years of adjuvant endocrine therapy. And the higher the uh, clinical risk at diagnosis, the higher the risk to develop these recurrence also at long term follow up. So for especially high risk patient like a patient with uh, uh, more than four positive nodes, there is high need to develop an uh, escalating strategy to avoid, uh, avoid having this patient relapsing at long term. One approach that has been investigated uh, with three randomized trials presented in 2020 has been the inclusion of CDK46 inhibitor for one or two years in the early setting. The first trial, and actually the only positive trial in this setting, was the Monarch E study that investigated uh, the use of abemacyclib for two years in addition to standard endocrine therapy in more than 5,600 patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Importantly, all patients had to have node positive disease. The majority had more than four positive nodes, so very high risk patient population. Uh, patient with uh, one to three positive nodes were allowed to be included in the trial if they had other high risk features like grade three tumor or more than five centimeter tumor, so T3, T4 tumors. Or in a second court of the trial, this patient had a high KICC7, so a kind of luminal B like biology. The trial was presented at ESMO a few months ago and published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology at a median follow up of 15.5 months. But at the recent San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, the authors have presented updated survival analysis with four additional months of median follow-up. 
and the trial confirmed to be positive with a 3% absolute difference in invasive disease-free survival favoring the oligocyclic arm in the intention to treat population, so in the whole population with the uh, IDFS moving from 89.3% to 92.3% with a hazard ratio of 0.713. And this benefit was observed irrespective of, pa of patient subgroups, so in uh, irrespective of nodal status, uh, grade, uh, tumor size, pr uh, prior chemotherapy, menopausal status, and uh, all uh, patient baseline characteristics. And there was an interesting possible discussion from this trial suggesting a potential uh, higher benefit, larger benefit in patients with a luminal B-like biology, so in patients with a high KI67, in which the absolute difference in favoring abemacycline could be up to 5%. Also in terms of this relapse free survival, the same benefit that was observed in uh, invasive disease free survival was observed also for this important endpoint, 3% absolute difference, uh, uh, even better uh, hazard ratio, suggesting that indeed the addition of a cycle reduces the development of these recurrences, which is what we want to see with this type of, uh, of more toxic regimen. The other two trials have investigated the, uh, the use of palbocycline as adjuvant treatment. Both of them uh, uh, did not show any advantage with the use of palbocycline in this setting. First trial, the PALA study, adjuvant uh, uh, setting uh, as a very similar design as compared to the monarchy trial, two years of palbocycline in addition to endocrine therapy in more than 5,600 patients with uh, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. However, the patient population was a bit uh, lower risk as compared to the, uh, the one included in the uh, monarchy trial with some patients with no negative disease that could be enrolled and uh, also less patients with uh, uh, more than four positive nodes. The trial did not show any difference in uh, survival outcomes between uh, endocrine therapy alone and endocrine therapy plus palbocyclib, no difference in IDFS, no dis difference in this and relapse free survival, with a similar median follow-up as compared to the one of monar the monarchy trial. One potential explanation after uh, the presentation at uh, ESMO of this data was the possibility that this, uh, um, this lack of a benefit for uh, the addition of palbocycline was probably due to, the, to a very high discontinuation rate. More than 40% of patients in the palbocycline have discontinued treatment. However, at the recent San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, the authors have reported the exploratory analysis to try to see if duration of palbocycline, exposure to palbocycline, or actually the per protocol population, so those patients that received the treatment as per uh, um, as, as was scheduled in, in the trial, could benefit more from the addition of palbocycline. However, also this landmark analysis and this per protocol analysis could not suggest any potential benefit from the, uh, um, with the addition of palbocycline to standard endocrine therapy. At the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, there was uh, also an important presentation of another adjuvant trial, actually post-neoadjuvant trial, with the use of palbocycline, in this case for one year, not two years, uh, uh, called the Penelope B trial. Smaller trial, uh, 1,250 patients uh, randomized. Those patients at uh, high risk of disregarding, so those patients with no pathologic complete response, and actually a CPS EG score uh, more, the, more or equal than three or more equal than two, but with uh, node positive disease at the time of surgery, with the CPS EG score being a better uh, way to uh, stratify the uh, prognosis of patient after neoadjuvant treatment based on the clinical stage of diagnosis and also the response to neoadjuvant treatment. As you can see, more than 50% of the patient had uh, from uh, zero to three lymph nodes and half of the patient population had more than four positive nodes. This is the trial with the longest media follow-up, 42.8 months. And what the trial is suggesting overall is no difference between the two options, so no survival advantage with the use of uh, with the addition of palbocycline to endocrine therapy. However, it's interesting to know that at two years, there was an apparent 4% difference uh, in uh, invasive disease-free survival. And this 4% absolute difference, so uh, uh, kind of in the same direction of the monarchy trial, could not be observed at four years with the same survival outcomes at, at four years. And I'm going back to this point late, later on. 
Similarly, there was no difference also in type of first uh, invasive survival events, also in terms of distal recurrences. In this case, there is no signal that the addition of albocycline prevent uh, the development of distal recurrences in this setting. In a, very, in, the very, in a very nice discussion of this trial at the recent San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, uh, 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 Dr. O'Regan presented the, uh, and tried to better un uh, understand why these different results between the uh, two palbocyclic trials as compared to the uh, abemacyclic trial. These trials have different features in terms of duration of treatment, uh, type of CDK4-6 inhibitor uh, given, uh, median follow-up, type of population included, and also discontinuation rate that was quite high in balance and much lower in both Penelope and uh, Monarchy. So potential explanation uh, that the, author, that the uh, author has tried to give was on one side, the different patient population included, even though it's not really true that uh, only the high risk patient population of monarchy can explain this, these results because also the population of Penelope B was a high risk patient population. It can be a, a, a potential differences between the different CDK46 inhibitor with abemacycline being more effective than a palbocycline. However, this is not confirmed so far with the data that we have in the, uh, in the advanced setting. The duration of CDK46 inhibition can have a role, two years in the monarchy, one year in Penelope B. We are gonna see with the ribocyclib arm given CDK46 inhibitor for three years, uh, what is the, uh, the final result. Also, therapy adherence, that was a kind of explanation uh, after the ESMO uh, presentation, probably with the results of post Penelope, low discontinuation rate, as well as the exploratory analysis of uh, uh, PALAS in the per protocol patient population or the landmark analysis according to duration and exposure to palbocyclic are not suggesting that this is a, an, an explanation on these regards. What is very important to highlight is that we need longer follow-up to try to see if actually this treatment is, improve, is in, uh, improving the, uh, the survival outcomes of our patient and is not only uh, delaying the time to uh, developing this, this recurrence and is not a, trying, uh, the, uh, uh, a, a kind of metastatic disease that was under diagnosis at the time of, uh, of diagnosis. So it's going to be very important to, uh, to look at the long-term follow-up also from Monarchy and the other CDK46 inhibitor trials. Very briefly, some more information on the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative patient population. The um, important data in terms of uh, a genomic test and the possibility to avoid the use of chemotherapy in some of these patients. We know from the taylor X trial the possibility to avoid chemotherapy in patients with a recurrent score between 11 and 25, especially for the postmenopausal patient population with some special consideration in the premenopausal uh, patient uh, population. However, the data that we, ha that we had were for the node negative uh, luminal-like uh, patient population. At the recent San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium and simultaneously published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, the authors from Taylor X have reported a, 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 an analysis that have tried to improve the prognostication and how to, uh, and how to better select patients that can be spared the toxicity of chemotherapy. And they have built this model based on the recurrent score as well as with clinical and uh, pathological characteristics, tumor grade, tumor size, and age. And this tool is now freely available online and can help to better uh, uh, to, uh, to improve the prognostication of patients in, uh, in this setting. And, uh, uh, but again, this is in non-negative patient. At the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, we had a presentation of the uh, respondent trial, very much awaited trial to try to see if it's possible to de-escalate chemotherapy also in patients with one to three positive nodes and a recurrent score of less than 25 that were randomized to chemotherapy plus endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. More than 5,000 patients randomized uh, to these two treatment arms. Overall, the trial did not meet its primary endpoint because uh, it seems to be that chemotherapy is beneficial 1.4% absolute difference in invasive disease survival at five years with a hazard ratio of 0.81, and the p-value that was uh, statistically significant. However, the results uh, uh, broken down according to menopausal status 
has clearly shown where the benefit of chemotherapy was observed. Apparently, there is no difference in the postmenopausal patient population, exactly the same survival at five years, irrespective of the addition or not of chemotherapy, no difference in distant recurrences, and the benefit that appears to be quite important, 5% absolute difference in the premenopausal patient population. However, as in the Taylorix trial, most of the patients did not receive ovarian function suppression, so they received a suboptimal uh, endocrine therapy according to uh, current standards. So we, we may speculate that here there's also a potential chemoendocrine effect of chemotherapy. However, based on this data, we cannot say that it's safe to avoid chemotherapy in premenopausal patients with a recurrent score less than 25 and one, two, three positive involved. Same results irrespective of a recurrent score. So also in those patients less than 13 or uh, between 14 and 25, no benefit with the use of chemotherapy in the postmenopausal patient population and a benefit with those in premenopausal patient. And again, no, no, uh, the, um, uh, the results did not change according to a number of positive nodes. So one or two, three positive nodes. Finally, a few words on survivorship in early breast cancer, specifically for those patients receiving adjuvant endocrine therapy. This is important to be discussed and to discuss survivorship issues because we know that a high proportion of patients can be non-adherent to treatment and non-adherence to treatment to adjuvant endocrine therapy means worse survival outcomes. And this has been confirmed also at the recent San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. At this meeting, there was a presentation of an important randomized trial to try to target and to improve depressive symptoms. In this case, it was among young breast cancer patients. And the, rand the randomization was between uh, two different programs, a mindfulness awareness practices, survivorship education, or a third arm with a waiting list. And the trial has demonstrated that these approaches may improve the uh, quality of life for our patients in terms of depression, also at long term, uh, but also other, other side effects, anxiety, fatigue, hot flesh, as well as sleep disturbance. Uh, important data at this meeting also for young women wishing to complete their family planning following treatment completion. A large international meta-analysis suggested that breast cancer patients still remain among cancer survivors, uh, those with the lowest chances together with cervical cancer survivors of having a future pregnancy, more than 60% reduced chances. A potential explanation are the safety concern that both patient and physician still have on this topic. This meta-analysis suggests that the, the majority of babies born from this patient have no problems, no uh, major differences as compared to healthy women from the general population in terms of reproductive outcomes, no increased risk, significant increased risk of congenital abnormalities in these babies. There was an increased risk, however, of some pregnancy complications like cesarean section, low birth weight, preterm birth, and small for gestational age, suggesting the need to monitor more closely these pregnancies. Importantly, on the mother's side, this study showed that there was no difference in disease-free survival nor in overall survival, or actually a better survival outcome for a patient with a pregnancy after breast cancer as compared to those without a potential pregnancy, also after adjusting for the potential healthy mother effect, suggesting that after proper treatment and follow-up, pregnancy after breast cancer is safe and should not be contraindicated. And so it's important to discuss this topic, pregnancy and fertility, with all young patients with newly diagnosed cancer, including breast cancer patients. And recently, ESMO guidelines has been published on this topic. And with that, I wish to thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm Julia Maues. I'm here to speak on the patient perspective about breast cancer research this past year. During, during this Oncolert sym symposium, uh, you have the opportunity to see experts in the field talking about the latest discoveries and what new treatments can help patients live longer and better lives. Um, I'm not going to talk about those discoveries. What I'll do is I'll talk about gaps and what we patients still need. Um, first, I'll, I'll start with uh, recurrence, especially for hormone positive breast cancer. Uh, it's a big cloud on uh, the minds of anyone diagnosed with breast cancer, no matter the subtype, especially for 
ER positive breast cancers and um, that cloud doesn't go away after five years uh, like uh, it is often um, idealized in people's minds. Um, the, in the metastatic setting, the resistance to ER positive treatment is um, also a big question and um, patients really need uh, more work on that. Um, this year, there were a number of new treatments approved, um, but oftentimes these new great drugs uh, come with great toxicity. Um, so it's, it's very important that patients not only live longer lives, but that we also live good lives. Um, and two examples that come to mind from this year are alpelisib and DSA-201, uh, which for some patients, um, a large number of patients are very difficult drugs to tolerate. Uh, one other issue, which is... Um, very important uh, to me personally and um, to a group of patients that are now working on this um, project led by Christine Hodgson called the Marina Kaplan uh, Breast Cancer Brain Mets uh, Project under the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance. So the issue of brain mets and why patients are excluded from trials if they have brain mets or the lack of research on even preclinical work on brain mets. Um, and then finally, immunotherapy for breast cancer, why we haven't had the successes of other cancers. And um, last but not least, disparities. Um, it is it should be unacceptable for every single person that we have the disparities that we do, um, especially by race, but also by uh, many other demographics and um, socioeconomic uh, circumstances. Um, these are issues that absolutely need to be addressed head on. And um, fortunately, we are seeing some of this be addressed head on. Uh, the San Antonio Symposium that just happened last week was kicked off um, with a, a long session on disparities um, with a patient voice on the center stage joined by a leader in the field, uh, Dr. Chuck Peru and uh, Mae McCarmo. So it was really great to see that get the attention that it got, and we hope that it stays in the limelight because it needs to be addressed. Julia, thank you for that warm introduction. I'm so thrilled to be a part of the conversation today with Uncle Alert and Gil and his team. Um, I am the president and founder of the Tiger Lily Foundation, and I'm a 14-year survivor of triple negative breast cancer. Um, first, I want to thank all of our allies watching this for their support of, um, of us brown and black people as you work together with us this year to find ways to collaborate to end disparities and to bridge the gaps that exist for people who are black and brown um, living with cancer and being impacted by it and dying from it every day. Um, this year we had an amazing and powerful year. It was painful in terms of some things that happened with health inequities. Um, but through that pain, I think we found a way to collaborate in a way that was different, that was more vulnerable, that was more raw, authentic, um, painful, uncomfortable, but yet powerful. And I think that unless we hear people's pain and vulnerabilities, we can't get to a place of healing and transformation. And so as an organization, we work to get a lot of things done this year. Um, we were, began last year by launching our um, Alliance for Disparities. But we partner with organizations to come together to partner and see how we can be a collaborative that um, brings um, light and shines light on those challenges that we face as black and brown people and work to collaborate to end those barriers. Um, we also launched our angel advocacy program as well last year, which trains patients of color who live in cities that have the highest death rate for black women and breast cancer. Um, these women are powerful advocates. They begin to use their voices, they begin to sit on panels, share their stories, 
and really work as leaders with scientists, researchers, and partners and industry partners across the world. Um, we also took our patients to ASCO virtually this year in May and June, May slash June. Um, we partnered with GRASP to launch our bi-directional patient um, of color series that works with allies who are white allies to educate them on what we feel, what we face, and how we can collaborate again to end barriers for this population. We partnered with Black and Cancer for a powerful um, um, social media campaign and activation during um, a one week conversation on barriers and what we face as Black people in science and how to get more Black nurses, nurse navigators, investigators, and people of color involved in science to partner with our allies as well. Um, we launched some viral video series around disparities and how to partner. We also worked to um, launch our inclusion pledge, which was a rallying cry and a beautiful um, framework that gives people who are allies a way to collaborate with us um, to create specific, measurable, accountable goals to our, that are tangible ways to end barriers. Meaning that um, if you have a privilege as an ally, how to use that for power to work to end barriers by making actionable change that's measurable. So we mapped out barriers to care that people of color face. And then we looked at how our allies can support us in working to end these barriers once and for all. Um, lastly, we had a, a very powerful event. We worked with AACR and SABCS to host um, one of the biggest activations this year at San Antonio Breast, where for the first time in its history, they had a had me, a black woman, um, immigrant led organization, um, and a black patient advocate open the program with a conversation on the importance of learning about black people, what we face systemically in terms of racism and how that pain runs deep and how it hurts and how that impacts, um, impacts education, literacy, trust, adherence to care and how it results in death, death for many black and brown people. Um, Sean Johnson, my friend and colleague, joined us to discuss the history of racism in Black America and white America and how that continues today and how we have to work to stop it. Um, and then we discussed the science of um, how to collaborate or with, with Black patients and knowing our history and work to end barriers to care as well. And so it's been a, um, a painful year. It's been a powerful year. It's been one of trauma, um, but it's been one that's made us have conversations we wouldn't have had before. We've talked about things and been vulnerable, discussed our pains, our hurts, um, work to forgive and to heal. Because without having these conversations that are really tough to have, um, we can't get to a place and a path of healing and growth and transformation to achieve health equity once and for all. And so Julia, thank you for um, the introduction. And Gail, thanks for all you do. And I hope you all have a wonderful symposia we look forward to working with you next year and doing great things together. Thank you so much. Be well. Hello, I'm Dr. Hope Brugo from the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center. And it's a pleasure to talk to you today for the Onco Alert Colloquium about advanced breast cancer, triple negative disease, the year in review. These are my disclosures. So first we're gonna talk about a key and hot topic, immunotherapy for triple negative advanced breast cancer. Of course, targeting the PD-1 pathway in breast cancer came about uh, due to success in treating other solid tumors. However, there was concern that breast cancer would not be an ideal target because of the lack of immune infiltration in the most common set of, subset of breast cancer, hormone receptor positive disease. Additional studies revealed that triple negative breast cancer might be an optimal candidate for cancer immunotherapy because of the higher rate of mutational complexity, the presence of PD-1 tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and the association of TILs with prognosis in the early stage setting. In addition, a variety of studies showed higher rates of PD-L1 expression in tumor cells and immune cells. Of course, triple negative breast cancer up until the last year and a half had no current targeted therapy options and we've made great progress. Initial basket trials found response rates in the 18 to 19% rate 
in pretreated patients who received single agent pembrolizumab or atezolizumab. Additional studies were then conducted, which expanded treatment in patients with PDL1 positive disease using different criteria. The striking findings here were a response rate in the first line setting between 20 to 25% and very low response rates in the second or greater line setting. But remarkably, in patients with PDL1 positive disease, who had responses to single agent checkpoint inhibitor, overall survival was significantly greater than anything seen with any other therapies that we had available for triple negative disease. The next step, of course, was to treat patients earlier in the course of metastatic disease based on the findings from the single agent studies. In addition, uh, the, because a small number of patients appeared to benefit from checkpoint inhibitor therapy, the goal was to enhance the host immune response by a mechanism that had previously been found to enhance both tumor um, mutational complexity as well as infiltrating lymphocytes. And of course, the easiest way to do that was with chemotherapy. So chemotherapy was next combined with checkpoint inhibitors as a way to increase host immunity, increase tumor antigen exposure, and improve the response and progression-free survival and hopefully overall survival in patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Of course, there are a number of different ways to try and enhance the host immune response, and many of these are currently being studied or have already been studied in combination with checkpoint inhibitors. In Passion 130 was the first trial to show benefit of a checkpoint inhibitor combined with chemotherapy in the first line setting for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. In patients who had PDL1 positive disease defined as 1% or greater of the immune cells being positive with the SP142 antibody, progression-free survival was significantly increased, shown here from 5.3 to 7.5 months. And impressively and more importantly, overall survival was also improved by seven months with a hazard ratio of 0.71. There was no benefit in either PFS or overall survival in patients who had PDL1 immune cell negative disease. 41% of patients enrolled in Impassion 130 were, had tumors that were positive in the immune cells by SP142. Of note, this trial included patients who had relapsed at least 12 months after their last treatment with curative intent in the early stage setting or who had de novo metastatic disease. Most recently, Leisha Emmons updated the overall survival at ESMO 2020 from Impassion 130. This shows you the overall survival in the pdl one IC positive population, where you can see now that the absolute difference in overall survival is seven and a half months, shown here in the medians. In addition, three-year overall survival increases from 22 to 36 percent, adding uh, atezolizumab to, NAB, to weekly nab paclitaxel. In a subset analysis for overall survival, patients who had no prior taxane appeared to have an even better hazard ratio than those treated with a prior taxane, probably because of development of multiple mechanisms of resistance. Keynote 355 was the next positive trial to be presented, a combining a checkpoint inhibitor with chemotherapy. This trial was designed a little bit differently. Patients received the checkpoint inhibitor pembrolizumab or placebo in combination with chemotherapy, but the randomization was two to one. Chemotherapy partners could include nabpaclitaxel or paclitaxel given weekly, or gemcitabine and carboplatin giving, given two weeks on, one week off, and this was made by physician choice. Patients were eligible who had developed recurrent disease six months or greater after last treatment of curative intent in the early stage setting, or who had de novo metastatic disease. Stratification included PDL1 tumor expression, but using a different antibody 22C3 and a different scoring system called CPS, one or more being positive or less than one being negative. Based on data from another trial called Keynote 119, which demonstrated increasing response and overall survival with single agent pembrolizumab compared to standard chemotherapy with PDL1 enrichment, the endpoint for Keynote 355 was changed before the trial was unblinded and before any results were available. 
The primary endpoint became progression-free survival in patients with PD-L1 CPS 10 or more disease. Interestingly, this represented 38% of patients, almost identical to the patients who were positive by SP142 for PDL1 in the atezolizumab in passion trial. CPS is a scoring system that includes PDL1 positivity on both immune cells as well as tumor cells and then divides by the total number of lymphocytes. As you can see here, in the 38% of patients who had a PDL1 CPS of 10 or more, the progression-free survival improved from 5.6 to 9.7 months with an absolute improvement of 4.1 months and a hazard ratio of 0.65. This p-value of 0 0.0012 met the pre-specified p-value boundary of 0 0.00411. This data was published recently in Lancet by Javier Cortez as the first author. Here you can see 75% of patients had a CPS of one or greater the progression-free survival difference is very similar to the intent to treat group at about two months. We presented at San Antonio this year, additional data from Keynote 522, evaluating progression-free survival in subgroups by on-study chemotherapy. If you focus on the group who had a CPS of 10 or more for PDL1, you can see that all patients appeared to benefit from the addition of pembrolizumab, regardless of whether their chemotherapy partner was nab paclitaxel, paclitaxel, or gemcitabine and carboplatin. And here you can see the differences in median PFS. The differences appear to be enhanced in patients receiving paclitaxel or nab paclitaxel with similar hazard ratios and to be less pronounced in patients receiving gemcitabine and carboplatin. However, this trial was not powered to look at differences between different chemotherapy partners, and all subgroups appear to benefit from the addition of pembrolizumab. We also reported data by subgroup of overall response and clinical benefit rate. Here you can see the PDL1 CPS 10 or more group evaluating the improvement in response rate with the addition of pembrolizumab to NAB paclitaxel, paclitaxel, and gemcitabine and carboplatin. Here's the duration of response, which is a remarkable difference going from 7.3 months to 19.3 months with the addition of pembrolizumab in the subset of patients who had a CPS of 10 or more. This shows you some of the toxicities that are observed in patients receiving checkpoint inhibitors. The most common toxicities that have been observed, particularly the most common toxicity requiring steroids has been rash. The most common endocrine toxicity is hyper and hypothyroidism, and hyperthyroidism often predates hypothyroidism. Other toxicities are less common, but include an immune-related event in almost any organ in the body, including colitis, hepatitis, pneumonitis, and other organ involvement that are even less common, such as nephritis, uh, myositis, um, and adrenal insufficiency. These toxicities are low, and what you can see is uh, that the uh, higher grade toxicities are found at even lower percentages. Now at ESMO this year, we saw interesting data presented from the Impassion 131 trial. This trial tried to expand the results of Impassion 130 by randomizing patients with similar eligibility criteria two to one to receive paclitaxel with either atezolizumab or a placebo. Patients received steroids for the first two infusions. Surprisingly, there was absolutely no difference in progression-free survival in patients who had pd one disease defined by the same SP142 antibody with 1% or more. In addition, there was absolutely no difference in overall survival, regardless of whether we evaluated the patients who had PDL1 positive disease or the intent to treat population. Impressively, patients with PDL1 positive disease who received paclitaxel alone had a median overall survival of 28 months, which is the longest that has ever been reported. This suggests that there might be differences in the biology of the tumors in patients who were randomized in the control arm that comprised just about 100 patients compared to the overall population of patients enrolled in the trial. In addition, the PFS seen in the control group in the atezolizumab treated patients was almost identical to the control group seen in Impassion 130. 
This was perplexing data and led to a lot of discussions about why there could be such discordance between different trials. Here you can see the trials uh, laid out in a table, looking at the PDL1 positivity by different uh, antibodies, the number of patients, which is quite comparable. And here you can see the percent that were PDL1 positive. The randomization was either two to one or one to one. The major difference here was the use of paclitaxel versus nabpaclitaxel. And here all three options were included uh, as options for physicians to choose. There were more patients with de novo metastatic disease and impassion 130, but similar numbers in Keno 355 and 131. Prior taxane use was relatively similar, a little smaller number in Keno 355. I showed you the progression-free survival differences in the PDL1 positive population, and overall survival data for Keno 355 is still early, but is expected in 2021. So what could these discordant results be due to? Well, certainly the chemotherapy partner is one option. Paclitaxel was also used in Keno 355, so that doesn't really make sense. And I showed you in the breakdown that paclitaxel appeared to be a uh, positive partner in terms of improving PFS in the CPS 10 or more group in Keno 355. Steroids were also used in Keno 355, both to, uh, as pre-medications for paclitaxel, for nausea, for gem carbo, and to treat immune toxicities. Perhaps variation in patient population uh, is the reason for this differential. Differences in de novo disease and possible differences in markers like ER from early to late stage disease. The Impassion 130 results remain significant with overall survival benefit and accelerated FDA approval and Keynote 355 led to accelerated FDA approval of pembrolizumab in combination with the menu of chemotherapy agents used in that study in November of 2020, and we await overall survival data in 2021. Considerations that are important include the chemotherapy partner, as we discussed. I would choose nabpaclitaxel in patients who still have taxane-sensitive disease, and gemcitabine and carboplatin in patients who have taxane-resistant disease. In addition, it's important to use the right PDL1 test for the chosen checkpoint inhibitor, as these groups do not completely overlap. There are many new directions and uh, ongoing trials that are evaluating checkpoint inhibitors in metastatic triple negative breast cancer. In Passion 132 is evaluating gem carbo or capecitabine with atezolizumab or placebo in early relapsers, and we expect to see results from that study next year. Keylink 009 is an ongoing trial that is evaluating the combination of the PARP inhibitor Olaparib with pembrolizumab as maintenance therapy after response or stable disease to an induction including gemcitabine, carboplatin, and pembrolizumab. Patients get randomized to either the doublet or continued triplet therapy. In this very nice paper in Lancet Oncology by Esteva and colleagues, uh, you can see there are numbers of different trials going on with combinations included targeting therapy, radiation therapy, uh, chemo radiotherapy, and other agents. And this shows you the whole host of trials that are going on, including in addition to triple negative disease, HER2 positive disease, and hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So let's move on to another exciting area, antibody drug conjugates, novel agents, and the expanded use of PARP inhibitors. Sasituzumab govotecan is a first-in-class TROPE2 directed antibody drug conjugate. TROPE2 is highly expressed in all subtypes of breast cancer and has been linked to poor prognosis. The antibody drug conjugate is an antibody to TROPE2 with a linker uh, and then SN38, the active metabolite of irinotecan that is attached by linker to this antibody. SN38 is more potent than the parent compound irinotecan, and there are many uh, toxins attached per antibody. The drug to antibody ratio is close to eight to one. Data from a phase two expansion trial with, in patients with heavily pretreated triple negative breast cancer showing an overall response rate of 33.3%, which was durable, led to uh, FDA approval, accelerated FDA approval for sasituzumab govotecan in heavily pretreated patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. In addition, this agent has fast track designation in metastatic urothelial cancer. 
The ASCENT trial was a phase three confirmatory trial of sasetizumab govotecan in refractory metastatic triple negative breast cancer that was meant to mirror the population of patients in the expanded phase two trial that led to accelerated approval. 529 patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer had received at least two chemotherapy regimens for advanced disease with no upper limit in the number of therapies were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive sasetizumab govotecan, which is given on a day one and eight every three-week schedule versus treatment of physician choice, including iribulin, venerelbine, gemcitabine, or capecitabine. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival in patients without brain metastases, and there was a predefined maximum of 15% for patients with stable brain metastases. They enrolled 13%. 53% of patients who received treatment of physician choice received iribulin, and then relatively similar uh, numbers of patients received the other three agents. 70% of patients had triple negative disease when they were first diagnosed with breast cancer. The median prior regimens was four with an impressive range of two to 17, and this included early stage therapies as well. And almost all patients had visceral disease. Due to compelling evidence of efficacy by unanimous data safety monitoring committee recommendation, ASCENT was halted early and data was presented at ESMO by Aditya Bardia this year. As you can see, there was a 3.9% absolute improvement in progression-free survival, which was highly statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.41. Notably, the PFS for TPC, treatment of physician choice, was just 1.7 months compared to 5.6 months with sasetizumab. Even more impressively, overall survival was markedly improved. There was a 5.4 month absolute improvement in overall survival with a median uh, overall survival of 6.7 months in treatment of physician choice, increasing to 12.1 months in patients receiving sasetizumab with a hazard ratio of 0.48, again, highly statistically significant. This shows you progression-free survival in the subset analysis, and I've highlighted several important areas for us in clinical practice. It didn't matter whether you'd had two to three or more than three prior therapies in terms of the benefit, and benefit was similar whether you had liver metastases or did not, and interestingly, whether your initial diagnosis was triple negative breast cancer or whether it was hormone receptor positive or another subset of disease. Overall response was also markedly increased, and you can see the percentages here, just 5% in TPC, increasing to 35% with sasetizumab, and the median duration of response was almost doubled from 3.6 to 6.3 months. Now at San Antonio this year, there were two presentations. I'm just showing you one, and this is an exploratory analysis of trope two and germline BRCA mutations on the uh, progression-free survival and overall survival seen with sasetizumab govotecan presented by Sarah Hurwitz. Trope two expression was assessed by immunohistochemistry, and you can see here an H score was used to define trope two as low, medium, or high. The low group included zero as well as an H score less than 100. Clinical benefit with sasetizumab, govotecan versus treatment of physician choice in previously treated metastatic triple negative dis, uh, breast cancer was seen irrespective of the level of trope two expression. Although there appeared to be a trend towards improved uh, progression free survival compared to TPC in patients who had medium to high scores shown here. And the same trend is seen in overall survival However, the number of patients who had trope two low scores was so small, it's difficult to understand whether this is a true finding. Here you can see that overall response was also increased regardless of whether trope two uh, was medium or high. Sasetizumab govotecan was equally effective whether patients had a germline BRCA mutation or not. Additional data that I haven't shown you here included the small subset of patients who had brain metastases. These patients overall had a very short PFS, but they appeared to benefit from sasetizumab govotecan compared to treatment of physician choice. The most common toxicities from sasetizumab include neutropenia, diarrhea, nausea, alopecia, and fatigue. This shows you the difference in grade three neutropenia and all grade diarrhea, and 10% had grade three diarrhea. Growth factor with filgrastin was used much more commonly with sasetizumab govotecan than treatment of physician choice. Although adverse events leading to discontinuation uh, were not different and dose reductions were similar. 
Sasetizumab gobutecan is a new standard of care for metastatic triple negative breast cancer with improved PFS and OS compared to treatment of physician choice. The toxicity is predictable and manageable, and there is an ongoing trial called Tropix O2 evaluating sasetizumab versus TPC in hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. One other antibody drug conjugate has been specifically tested in patients with advanced triple negative breast cancer. And this anti-ADC is called ladaritizumab uh, and it's an, uh, it is, targets LIV1A. So the antibody targets LIV1A, which is also highly expressed in triple negative breast cancer. And it's linked to the microtubule toxin MMAE, an orostatin analog. Ladaritizumab vedotin has toxicity given every three weeks, but a current study is evaluating ladaritizumab on a weekly basis, and early data suggests that there is less toxicity and continued efficacy against TNBC. And then I thought I'd show you this data from a waterfall plot with the combination of ladaritizumab with pembrolizumab, where an overall response rate was seen of 35% in 64 patients, quite impressive data, and we'll look for more information in the next year. What about other targeted agents? Well, we had high hopes for Ipatunity. Uh, Ipatunity is a trial presented by Rebecca Dent at San Antonio this year that evaluated the AKT inhibitor, apatacertib, with paclitaxel compared to placebo and paclitaxel. Patients were randomized two to one in the first line triple negative breast cancer setting who had known alterations in PIK3CA, AKT1, or P10. This was based on a phase two LOTUS trial that showed improved PFS in patients with these alterations and a suggestion of improved overall survival as well. Ipatunity 130 had two arms. Cohort B already presented no uh, benefit in progression-free survival, adding the AKT inhibitor to paclitaxel in hormone receptor positive disease. And unfortunately, cohort A in triple negative breast cancer found the same result. 255 patients were enrolled, and there was absolutely no difference in progression-free survival in patients who received placebo versus epatoceratib. These results differ from two other randomized phase two trials. I mentioned the LOTUS trial with epatoceratib, and there's also the PACT-T trial, which was updated at San Antonio with capivacertib, another AKT inhibitor. Phase three data from this combination of capivacertib with paclitaxel uh, still uh, is expected in the future. However, further analyses are ongoing in the opportunity trial to explore potential biomarkers of benefit from epatoceratib. There may be competing mechanisms of resistance in these patients with metastatic disease uh, that as well as uh, some degree of toxicity resulting in early discontinuation that could have impacted the benefit in phase three trials and this phase three trial, but I think it highlights how important phase three trials are to confirm phase two encouraging data. Another unique targeted agent is trilocyclib. This is an intravenous CDK4-6 inhibitor that transiently arrests hematopoietic stem cell progenitor cells and lymphocytes in the presence of chemotherapy and has been explored for its ability to prevent chemotherapy-induced damage on these progenitor cells. This trial, a randomized phase two trial, initially was uh, looking at both the ability to reduce uh, cytopenias, in particular neutropenia, with trilocyclib caused by gemcitabine and carboplatin, but also to look at the potential efficacy. Patients with metastatic triple negative disease who had received up to two lines of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting were randomized to gemcitabine and carboplatin alone or two different schedules of trilocyclib preceding gemcitabine and carboplatin. The preliminary data presented uh, last year at ESMO showed a significant increase in overall survival with trilocyclib. Uh, Joyce O'Shaughnessy presented this updated data showing continued benefit in patients who received uh, trilocyclib compared to those who received chemotherapy alone. It's important to keep in mind that the number of patients who were in each group represents only about 35 patients. So this is quite preliminary data, but you can see here the median PFS was also markedly different as well as the median overall survival. A phase three trial is planned in order to further evaluate this anti-tumor effect of trilocyclib. Now we know that uh, PARP inhibitors are uh, beneficial in patients who have uh, germline mutations in BRCA1 or 2, as demonstrated in the Olympiad 
and in bracket trials with olaparib and talazoparib approved for the treatment of patients with metastatic breast cancer associated with a germline mutation in either BRCA1 or BRCA2. We also saw in an uh, earlier trial that single agent carboplatin was beneficial compared to docetaxel in patients in the first line metastatic setting who uh, had germline BRCA mutations with an improved response and progression-free survival compared to docetaxel. Brocade 3 is a recent study published this year in Lancet Oncology that evaluated carboplatin and paclitaxel with the uh, weaker PARP inhibitor voliparib or placebo. They demonstrated an improvement in progression-free survival with the addition of voliparib to carboplatin and paclitaxel going from 12.6 months with placebo to 14.5 months uh, with voliparib with a hazard ratio of 0.705, and this was statistically significant. Thrombocytopenia and cytopenias overall were significantly increased with the use of voliparib, but there was an interesting uh, ongoing analysis of brocade 3. Crossover was allowed from the placebo arm to patients receiving voliparib. These patients all had germline BRCA mutations. In addition, 42.5% of patients who were on the carbo, paclitaxel, and voliparib arm stopped their chemotherapy after some response and continued with maintenance voliparib alone. It may be that the maintenance voliparib is what is responsible for the improvement in progression-free survival in brocade three, and that we could potentially avoid the greater toxicity of adding the PARP inhibitor to chemotherapy first and simply use the PARP inhibitor as maintenance. And additional studies are evaluating this as I'll describe in just a moment. Voliparib is a less potent PARP inhibitor and it can be combined with chemotherapy. Talazoparib and olaparib should not be combined with chemotherapy because of the overlapping toxicity of significant bone marrow suppression. Now, what could we do with patients who have other types of mutations? TBCRC 048, a consortium study now published in the JCO this year, evaluated uh, the uh, PARP inhibitor olaparib in patients who had a germline, other germline DNA damage repair defect associated mutations. So they included patients with ATM, CHECK2, PALB2, and some other less common mutations listed here. In addition, we were interested in this trial at evaluating the efficacy of the PARP inhibitor in patients who had acquired somatic mutations in BRCA1 and 2. Here you see the waterfall plots of patients who were treated in this trial best overall responses in germline mutations and somatic mutations. You can see that most of the responses were blue, indicating they had a BRCA1 or BRCA2 somatic mutations, and almost all of the responses here were green, indicating they had a germline PALB2 mutation. Here you can see the numbers, which are small, but partial response was seen in 82% of patients with germline PALB2 mutations and 50% of patients with somatic BRCA1 and 2 mutations no patient who had either a germline or somatic mutation, ATM or CHECK2, responded. 15 patients remained on study at the time of this presentation at ASCO 2020. Very encouraging data, and I think that this data should encourage us to consider a PARP inhibitor in patients who have germline PALB2 mutations or somatic mutations in BRCA1 and 2. So I've showed you exciting new directions in advanced triple negative breast cancer. Immunotherapy has clearly reached prime time. There are two approved checkpoint inhibitors combined with chemotherapy. Clearly, only a subset of patients can benefit who have PDL1 positive disease. And PDL1 enrichment, when the CPS is used, correlates with improved progression free survival response, and response, as well as duration of response. The chemotherapy partner appears to be important when combined with the tezolizumab the differential results seen with Keynote 355, we have yet to explain. For antibody drug conjugates, which has shown exciting data in HER2 positive disease and are being studied in a so-called HER2 low disease, sasituzumab is a new treatment option for triple negative breast cancer, showing both progression-free and overall survival advantages over treatment of physician choice. Moving this drug earlier in the course of therapy is appealing and combinations with immunotherapy are under investigation. Other antibody drug conjugates, of course, are being studied and another antibody drug conjugate has recently been approved for the treatment of HER2 positive, uh, heavily pretreated metastatic disease. 
At present, there are no other targeted agents that clearly benefit sporadic metastatic triple negative breast cancer, but PARP inhibitors appear active in patients with germline PALB2 mutations and somatic BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And the role is maintenance or in combination with chemotherapy uh, with immunotherapy after chemotherapy is intriguing. And in fact, the combination of gemcitabine, carboplatin, and pembrolizumab, uh, followed by randomization to pembrolizumab and olaparib versus continued triplet therapy is being studied in patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer in the Keylink 009 trial, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you very much for your attention. My name is Sarah Tulaney, and today we're going to be discussing highlights on early stage triple negative breast cancer over the past year. We're going to be covering the role of immunotherapy in early stage triple negative disease, as well as the challenges that surround choice of chemotherapy backbone and utilization of capecitabine in patients with residual disease after preoperative therapy, and finally touch upon where we may be headed in terms of future directions. So as we know, triple negative breast cancer is associated with shorter overall survival compared with other subtypes of breast cancer. And this is despite the receipt of anthracycline and taxane-based chemotherapy. So if you look here, you can see that survival outcomes are worse in the triple negative population compared to other breast cancer subtypes. And this is true stage for stage. We do, however, have some data to suggest that adding checkpoint inhibition to chemotherapy may improve outcomes for our patients with triple negative disease. These are data from the new adjuvant iSPY2 study in which patients were randomized to receive chemotherapy with paclitaxel followed by doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide or to receive the paclitaxel portion of the therapy with pembrolizumab. And we can see that the addition of pembrolizumab significantly improved rates of pathologic complete response from approximately 20 to 60%. And this was actually also true, not just in triple negative breast cancer, but interestingly also true in the hormone receptor positive subset. Given the robust data from the iSPY2 study, further work has been done now adding pembrolizumab to chemotherapy. We now have data from the Keynote 522 study in which patients with high-risk triple negative breast cancer were randomized to receive chemotherapy. In this case, it was uh, anthracycline, taxane, and platinum backbone with or without pembrolizumab prior to surgery. After surgery, all patients continued on either their pembrolizumab or placebo for an additional nine cycles of therapy. The primary endpoint of this study was a co-primary endpoint, which is to look at pathologic complete response as well as event-free survival. And so this trial, again, because it is also powered to evaluate event-free survival, enrolled a little over 1,100 patients. The study demonstrated that adding pembrolizumab to chemotherapy significantly improved rates of pathologic complete response from about 51 to almost 65%, consistent with the difference between the two arms of over 13%. Interestingly, there was benefit seen regardless of PDL1 status. So approximately 84% of this population was PDL1 positive, and we saw that benefit was seen both in the PDL1 positive patients as well as the PDL1 negative patients, with a difference of about 14% in the PDL1 positive group and a difference of around 18%, in fact, in the PDL1 negative group. We also saw that when looking at outcomes by degree of PDL1 expression, we can see again that benefit is seen across all patients, regardless of degree of PDL1 positivity. But it's important to note that PCR increases regardless of treatment group as PDL1 positivity increases. We also have data on event-free survival. At the time of the first interim analysis of event-free survival, based on the a little over 1,100 patients, we can see that there was a difference in event-free survival that went from 85% to 91%. However, this difference was not 
statistically significant, although consistent with a hazard ratio of 0.63, it did not meet the pre-calculated p-value for significance, which was set at 0.00051, um, so very high bar uh, for EFS. And so patients do continue to be followed for event-free survival in this trial. We then saw data from the NeoTrip study, which looked at a non-anthracycline chemotherapy backbone, so specifically looked at carboplatin plus NAB paclitaxel given prior to surgery for eight cycles with or without atezolizumab. Patients went to surgery after their pre-op chemotherapy and atezolizumab or placebo, and then afterwards received anthracycline-based chemotherapy for four cycles. The primary endpoint of the study was both uh, PCR and EFS, and we have, sorry, I, it actually, the primary endpoint was EFS, the secondary endpoint was PCR, but we've now seen the data for PCR. And we saw that there was an improvement that was only numerical in terms of PCR. So it went from 40 to about 43%, but no statistically significant difference in outcome. And this was true both in the PDL1 positive as well as in the PDL1 negative patients. And so this trial really demonstrated that adding checkpoint inhibition to carboplatin and NAB paclitaxel did not improve PCR. And we have yet to see the EFS data from this trial. This, however, stands in contrast to a recent trial that was actually just presented at San Antonio that was a small randomized phase two trial of carboplatin with paclitaxel with or without a tezolizumab. And in fact, this study demonstrated a significant improvement in PCR that went from 20 to about 55%. Importantly, this is a small trial and that was a randomized phase two study, but it does suggest a very different signal than what we saw in Neotrip. And so I do think further work needs to be done to further tease out if anthracycline therapy is truly needed to be given with checkpoint inhibition in the preoperative setting. We now also have data looking at a tezolizumab in combination with an anthracycline backbone from Impassion 031. This trial enrolled a little over 300 patients with high risk triple negative breast cancer and randomized them to receive NAB paclitaxel followed by adriamycin and cytoxan with or without a tezolizumab. Patients then went to surgery and after surgery received a tezolizumab for an additional 11 doses or observation and patients are followed by, for survival outpoint at endpoints. However, this study is not powered to evaluate event-free survival. When we look at the patient population that was enrolled, we can see that approximately 75% of patients had stage two disease with about over 20% of patients having stage three disease. We see that when looking at PDL1 status, a little over half of the patients were PDL1 positive and almost half were PDL1 negative. When looking at the co-primary endpoint of pathologic complete response, we can see that in the overall population, there was a significant improvement in PCR that went from 41 to 58%, so a delta of about 16.5%. This benefit was seen also in the pdl one positive patients, where it went from about 50 to almost 69%, so a difference of about 20%. And interestingly, also in the PDL1 negative patients, where we see an improvement from 34 to almost 48%. So adding a tezolizumab to adriamycin cytoxan and NAB paclitaxel is significantly improving PCR, both in the PDL1 positives and in the PDL1 negatives. And while this study is not powered to evaluate event free survival, we can see that at this point in time, there is a trend towards improved EFS favoring the atezolizumab arm with a hazard ratio of 0.76. When looking at adverse events, we can see that the most common immune-related toxicities are predominantly endocrine toxicities, with almost 10% of patients experiencing thyroid toxicity, but interestingly, no cases of adrenal insufficiency were seen in the atezolizumab arm. There has also been a look at health-related quality of life and patient-reported outcomes from this trial. And overall, the study demonstrated that patients in both arms experienced similar deterioration in health-related quality of life 
within the both arms that seemed to be of greatest magnitude during the preoperative chemotherapy portion of the study, predominantly between cycle three and five. Within the adjuvant period, we can see a nice rebound in terms of quality of life that gradually approached baseline um, over time. But you can see when looking at the difference between the two arms, there was no clinically meaningful differences seen in terms of quality of life. We can see here that worsening of treatment related symptoms was clinically meaningful, but was also comparable between the two arms. So again, no significant difference between the two arms, suggesting that the majority of these deteriorations are related to the chemotherapy and not the immunotherapy. So what do we do with this information? We now have two uh, large phase three trials that demonstrate improvement in PCR from addition of checkpoint inhibition to chemotherapy. So should we start prescribing checkpoint inhibitor therapy for all of our triple negative patients in the preoperative setting? I think some have argued, yes, there is a significant improvement in PCR. We know that PCR correlates with long-term outcomes, and we know that our triple negative patients relative to breast cancer patients with other subtypes of disease are at higher risk of relapse, and we need to do something to improve their outcomes. On the flip side, I think those others would argue that you know immunotherapy can be associated with lifelong toxicities. It is still unknown what the implications of immunotherapy will be on fertility for our young women. There's also not yet a statistically significant improvement in event-free survival at this point in time. Certainly both Impassion 031 and Keynote 522 show a trend towards improvement in EFS, but only Keynote 522 is appropriately powered to look at event-free survival and at this point has not yet reached statistical significance. And I think there are just finally lots of unanswered questions. We know that not all patients are gonna benefit from the addition of checkpoint inhibition, that many do well just with chemotherapy alone, and we do not yet have a biomarker of benefit. We saw that patients benefited regardless of pdl one status. We also don't know what the ideal chemotherapy backbone is. So in Keynote 522, patients received platinum in addition to taxane and anthracycline therapy, whereas in Impassion 031, patients just received anthracycline and taxane therapy. So is the platinum backbone really needed? And is it true that all patients really need anthracycline treatment? Certainly we have negative data from the Neotrip study suggesting that anthracyclines are needed, but now we have this question given the provocative findings from the NCI small randomized phase two study suggesting improvement in outcome even in a non-anthracycline backbone. So I think more work is needed to really tease out what the appropriate chemo backbone should be. Furthermore, what about the adjuvant phase of checkpoint inhibition? In these studies, patients were not given therapy based on their achievement of PCR. They were just treated with adjuvant checkpoint inhibition after surgery. And I'm not sure that this is really the right approach for all of our patients. And so I think we do need to figure out how to appropriately treat patients after completion of surgery, um, whether or not more checkpoint inhibition is actually needed, and whether or not that is dependent on achievement of PCR or not. So tackling some of these questions, one, does chemotherapy backbone matter? So we have some data from the TONIC study, which is a phase two trial of patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer who were randomized to receive nivolumab without an induction or with a two week induction of either radiation, cyclophosphamide, cisplatin, or doxorubicin, all followed by nivolumab. And this study demonstrated that the majority of responses were seen in patients with the anthracycline and platinum cohorts, where they saw an upregulation of immune related genes involved in the checkpoint inhibition and uh, in T cell cytotoxicity. So I think it's hard to know if this is really sufficient to explain the differences that we've seen between Keynote 522 and Neotrip. As Neotrip did not give any concurrent anthracycline, however, it did utilize a platinum backbone, which also from this study does seem to suggest there is synergy. So do we really need to give the platinum in all patients um, if we choose to give the anthracycline treatment. We now have data from several 
randomized studies in the preoperative setting that seem to suggest that adding platinum to chemotherapy does significantly improve PCR, as we can see across all of these studies. The challenge, however, is that these studies are not powered for event-free survival, and so we do not yet know if adding platinum to an anthracycline and taxane backbone is going to improve outcomes. There is an ongoing study led by the NRG looking at long-term outcomes in patients who got anthracycline, taxane, with or without platinum that will help address this question. But at this point in time, all we can say is that we know platinum will improve the PCR. And so in my mind, it is not clear if patients really need to be getting platinum in addition to their anthracycline and taxane. What about a difference in PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibition? Um, certainly we have positive data now from 522 as well as from Impassion 031. How do we choose between checkpoint inhibitors? Is one better than the other? And to date, we actually have no randomized data to know the answer to this question. And while this particular trial, the Contessa TRIO study, is not powered to actually analyze differences in checkpoint inhibitor therapy, perhaps it will give us some clues, as there will be tissue collected on this study that could maybe help us elucidate some biomarker differences in activity between uh, the three checkpoints. This trial is looking at the activity of a novel oral taxane tesataxel either with nivolumab or pembrolizumab or atezolizumab. A study was just recently amended, in fact, to increase enrollment to now about 200 patients, so we will get more robust data uh, from this trial. So when thinking about cho choice between checkpoint inhibitor therapy, not only is the question surrounding if there are efficacy differences, which we don't know the answer to, but what about toxicity differences? There certainly seems to be some suggestion that PDL1 inhibition is maybe associated with less toxicity. We can see when we put trials next to each other, again, doing the infamous uh, cross-trial comparisons, we can see that there are lower rates, for example, of thyroid toxicity in patients receiving atezolizumab. There are also lower rates of skin reactions and rash. And when we now have data from a meta-analysis, we can also see that meta-analysis data seems to suggest that PD-1 inhibition is associated with more toxicity compared to PD-L1. Um, so while we cannot conclude differences in efficacy, I do think there are strong signals to suggest differences in toxicity. What about sequence of checkpoint inhibitor therapy and chemotherapy? There has been some suggestion from the JetBarnoevo study that patients who got a window of exposure to checkpoint inhibitor prior to initiation of chemotherapy seem to have improvements in PCR. However, in the overall population, there was no improvement in pathologic complete response rate from the addition of dravalumab to anthracycline and taxane backbone therapy. But I think this does beg the question, does it matter what order we give therapy in? The registrational trials have just given concurrent treatment, but should we think about run-in windows of exposure of either checkpoint inhibition or chemotherapy first, and would this enhance outcomes to treatment? So I do think, again, further work needs to be done to answer this question. And so while we now have data to suggest that chemotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors improve PCR, these studies are giving a lot of therapy. So they're giving um, you know, anthracycline taxane, in some cases platinum therapy with a checkpoint inhibitor. Now while there seems to be dramatic improvements in PCR, do all patients really need all this chemotherapy? could we do just as well by de-escalating the chemo backbone? So there has been some attempt to explore this. This was in the ISPY2 arm of the study that looked at eight cycles of pembrolizumab in combination with paclitaxel and compared it to paclitaxel with anthracycline treatment. And while the study did not meet formal stopping rules, either for graduation or futility, it was not close to the th target threshold of PCR rates, um, both in the triple negative arm as well as in the hormone receptor positive patients. And so while there is some suggestion it performed just as well uh, as chemotherapy, I think the likelihood is quite low that this regimen would be superior to an anthracycline and taxane. And so I think we do need to do more work to figure out what the optimal amount of chemotherapy is when we give a checkpoint inhibitor. 
So what about this adjuvant phase of checkpoint inhibition? Again, these trials did not adapt therapy based on achievement of PCR. And so all patients, for example, in Keynote 522 did get nine cycles of adjuvant of pembrolizumab therapy. But this begs the question, what is the optimal duration of checkpoint inhibitor use? And in patients who've achieved a PCR, is more checkpoint inhibitor therapy really needed? And what about for those patients who failed to achieve a PCR? The checkpoint inhibitor um, therapy didn't work for them in the first place. Is giving more really going to improve their outcomes? And so again, while these trials have uniformly given additional checkpoint inhibitor therapy after surgery, I do think we need to rethink that. There are studies that are looking at the question of utilizing checkpoint inhibition in the adjuvant setting, such as the SWOG study, as well as the ABRAVE trial. The challenge is that these trials were designed in patients who didn't get pre-op checkpoint inhibition. So it does not address the question of if someone fails to achieve PCR to pre-op checkpoint inhibition, do they need more? These trials are really looking at patients who fail to achieve PCR to standard chemotherapy and then is looking to see if giving additional treatment with the checkpoint inhibitor is going to improve their long-term outcomes. So who do we actually give the checkpoint inhibitors to? Is it all triple negative breast cancer patients? I think we can see that there are larger benefits in patients with higher clinical risk disease. So we see that those patients who have more lymph node involvement, for example, achieve larger differences in pathologic complete response. And so I think this larger benefit in higher anatomic risk disease suggests that the benefits of checkpoint are likely going to far outweigh their risks in the high risk patient population. So what can we conclude for checkpoint inhibition for early stage triple negative disease? Right now, uh, these agents are not currently FDA approved. However, pembrolizumab will be reviewed by the FDA for approval in early 2021 based on its improvement in PCR. And so at this point, it is not yet standard of care to administer checkpoint inhibition. I do think it is critical that we do follow these patients for event-free survival, and we will need to see what Keynote 522 reports. These agents are associated with some potential risk for lifelong toxicities. And so I think we have to weigh risk and benefit. And so I think when we are making decisions about utilization of checkpoint inhibition, assuming approval occurs, I think it's likely we may want to consider restricting utilization to our higher risk patients because these are the patients that achieve larger benefits to checkpoint inhibition. I think we also need more work to understand what the optimal chemo backbone is. Do we really need anthracycline, taxane, platinum treatment, or can we get away with less? And finally, I think it's unclear if there will be benefit to post-operative checkpoint inhibition and if this treatment should really be tailored based on response to preoperative therapy. So moving forward, I think a lot of our studies have been based on utilizing achievement of PCR to tailor therapy. These studies have done so really because we know that achievement of PCR is associated with better event-free survival and overall survival. This is particularly true amongst patients with hormone receptor positive and triple negative breast cancer, where we can see uh, benefits across uh, these subsets. When we look at whether or not the amount of residual disease impacts long-term outcomes, we can see that there is a relationship between the residual cancer burden and EFS, where those patients who have an RCB1 response do seem to not do as well as an RCB0 and also do better than RCB3. And so I do think amount of residual disease is actually prognostic. So how can we improve outcomes for our patients with residual disease, understanding that they are at higher risk for relapse? We have data from the CREATE-X study, which took patients who had received preoperative chemotherapy and had residual disease and randomized them to receive capecitabine for eight cycles or to receive no additional therapy. This trial enrolled both triple negative as well as hormone receptor positive patients, and we saw that amongst those patients with triple negative disease, 
there was a significant improvement in disease-free survival that went from 56 to almost 70%. And there was also an improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.5. So these statistically significant improvements in both disease-free and overall survival have met, led many of us to adapt adjuvant capecitabine as a standard in patients with residual disease. Importantly, there was no benefit that was seen from adjuvant capecitabine amongst those patients with hormone receptor positive disease, with really the benefit being restricted to those patients with triple negative breast cancer. We have seen other studies also looking at benefits of adjuvant capecitabine. This um, study, the Cyboma GCAM trial, enrolled a little over 800 patients who had triple negative breast cancer. These patients could be treated with prior neoadjuvant therapy using anthracycline and taxane um, therapy, or could have received adjuvant chemotherapy and gone on to receive an additional eight cycles of capecitabine or undergo observation. After about seven years of follow-up, the primary endpoint being disease-free survival, demonstrated that at five years, about 80% of the capecitabine arm and about 77% of the observation arm were disease-free and alive, and really suggesting no difference between the two arms in terms of disease-free survival. There was also no difference seen in terms of overall survival, here with a hazard ratio of 0.9. This stands in contrast to a recent phase three trial that was uh, reported looking at metronomic capecitabine. So this study took patients who could have achieved, who could have received either preoperative or adjuvant chemotherapy and were randomized after completion of their chemo to receive capecitabine at a low dose, so at the metronomic sort of maintenance dose at six 150 milligrams per meter squared BID continuously for one year or to undergo observation. The study demonstrated a significant improvement in disease-free survival going from 76 to 85 percent consistent with a hazard ratio of 0.63. There however was not a statistically significant in overall survival although a trend was seen uh, and the overall survival went from 81 to about 76 to about 86 percent at five years. So we also now have data um, from meta-analyses looking at the benefits of capecitabine. The primary objective of this meta-analysis was to determine how treatment with capecitabine in fact it impacted disease-free survival across multiple trials as well as overall survival. The analysis involved over 15,000 patients from 12 randomized prospective trials. About half of the patients were involved in a control arm and slightly more than half of the patients did have stage two disease um, and about three quarters of the patients had nodal involvement. Most of the patients were treated with chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting, so about 80%, whereas about 20% had received neoadjuvant therapy. Here you can see the characteristics for the patient population with nodal involvement seen in about 75% of patients. 68% of the patients were hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive, and it was reported in about 15%, and 45% of the tumors were high grade. You can see here again that the majority of patients had received uh, treatment in the adjuvant setting. So when we look at the Cox regression analyses involving all patients in the data set, we can see that capecitabine was not associated with a significant improvement in disease-free survival, nor was a significant improvement seen in trials that compared capecitabine against other treatment options. In contrast though, adding capecitabine to systemic treatment supported a modest but significant improvement in disease-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.88. Across all patients, capecitabine was associated with an overall survival advantage, although this benefit was small with a hazard ratio of 0.89. This benefit became more pronounced when capecitabine was added to systemic therapy rather than replacing systemic treatment. Of importance, though, is that biological subtype showed that only patients with triple negative breast cancer were deriving survival benefit from capecitabine. Among patients with triple negative disease, a 17% overall survival benefit was associated with capecitabine, 
with a hazard ratio of 0.83. And when capecitabine was added to systemic treatment, this survival advantage improved with a hazard ratio of about 0.78. So given all these data now across several adjuvant trials, is adjuvant capecitabine a standard for our patients with residual disease after pre-op therapy? We now see that adjuvant capecitabine, at least in CREATE-X, is associated with improved disease-free and overall survival. And we can see this now also from the meta-analyses. But I do think further work is needed to understand the benefits of adjuvant capecitabine in patients who have received preoperative platinum and checkpoint inhibition, where we do not have these data yet. And I do think other novel strategies are needed to improve these outcomes further. So there are other post-preoperative trials that are ongoing. One such study is the ecog Akron study, which is taking patients with residual triple negative disease and re randomizing them to receive platinum for a total of four cycles or to receive adjuvant capecitabine for six cycles. So this will address the question of whether or not platinum is better than CAPE in the residual disease patients. But obviously this is for patients who did not receive preoperative pre platinum-based therapy. We also have a question about whether germline bracket carriers would um, benefit from adjuvant PARP inhibition. And so the Adjuvant Olympia study was exploring this and included patients who could have had residual disease after preoperative chemotherapy. And finally, there's a lot of interest in looking at novel agents in this residual disease population. Specifically, we know sasetuzumab govotecan is an antibody drug conjugate that has had robust activity in patients with refractory metastatic triple negative breast cancer, which sort of begs the question, could this agent work in patients who are chemorefractory in the early stage setting? So this trial is taking patients with residual disease and randomizing them to receive adjuvant sasetuzumab for eight cycles or physician's choice chemotherapy to help address uh, the question about whether or not sasetuzumab will be better than standard of care approaches in this population. So while we've used residual disease to help augment outcomes for our patients with triple negative disease, is residual disease really the best way to identify patients at high risk for relapse? So could we use other strategies? Could we use, for example, circulating tumor DNA to adapt our therapy? We do know that um, based on other trials that taking patients who have residual who have detectable ctDNA after preoperative therapy is associated with worse long-term outcomes. This was true across all subtypes of breast cancer. So having detectable ctDNA, in e even if you had ER positive disease, HER2 positive disease, or triple negative disease after preoperative therapy was associated with higher likelihood of relapse. We also know that detection of ctDNA at diagnosis, so before any treatment, was also associated with risk of relapse, suggesting the potential for incorporation of ctDNA potentially into future prognostic models um, in these preoperative trials. So given these data, there is now, um, there was also further supported work from a randomized study. So this uh, phase two randomized trial that was really looking at the utilization of genomically directed therapies in patients who have residual disease after preoperative therapy, recently reported um, association of ctDNA after preoperative treatment and its association with long-term outcomes. This study showed that if you had detectable ctDNA after your preoperative therapy, that the median disease-free survival was significantly worse um, than those patients who did not have any detectable ctDNA. This was also true in terms of overall survival, where again, you can see worse outcomes in those patients with ctDNA detected. I think it also begs the question is, could we utilize genomic information after preoperative therapy to potentially guide therapies. So if we look at the types of mutations that are seen in residual D DNA, we can see that there are lots of potential targets, including P3 kinase, AKT uh, mutations, and others. And so could we design such a study where we take patients with um, residual disease and detectable ctDNA and look at genomically directed therapies in this population to improve outcomes? 
And so I think, you know, while we've utilized more blanket approaches to develop therapies in triple negative disease, and we've used the neoadjuvant setting to inform how to adapt therapy in the adjuvant setting, I think we can even go further. We also need to focus on developing biomarkers to help us figure out the appropriate neoadjuvant strategies, and then potentially in the adjuvant setting, needing to adapt therapy, maybe not just on presence or absence of residual disease, but maybe taking it a step further and incorporating ctDNA into these findings. So just to summarize, I think what we've learned this year is that adding checkpoint inhibition to anthracycline-based chemotherapy does significantly improve PCR. We do need to await the final event-free survival data from Keynote 522 to understand if it is improving long-term outcomes. And I think there's still many unanswered questions in terms of choice of checkpoint, choice of chemo backbone, um, and whether or not there may be biomarkers to help us understand which patients really need checkpoint inhibition therapy. I think we've also seen that residual disease after preoperative therapy is associated with higher rates of recurrence, but that we can improve outcomes for these patients by utilizing adjuvant cubcitabine. And there are other agents that are being explored in this post-preoperative space, including agents like antibody drug conjugates, as well as genomically determined therapeutic strategies. Finally, I think we need other mechanisms to determine who is going to benefit from adjuvant systemic treatment. And maybe it isn't just presence or absence of residual disease. Maybe we need to be incorporating detectability of ctDNA to help us improve outcomes, not just for our patients who achieve PCR, who fail to achieve PCR, but maybe also for our patients who achieve a PCR because we still know some of those patients could relapse. So thank you very much. Hi, I am Ikru Miattini, Associate Professor at the University of Florence, Florence, Italy, and thank you, Onco Alert, for this kind invitation. Now we will review the Breast Radiation Therapy 2020 report. And this is my overview, hyperfractionation, partial breast radiation, optimization of treatment for very low-risk patients, and oligometastatic disease. Just to start, hyperfractionation. These are the 10-year results of the FAST trial, a randomized controlled trial of five-fraction whole breast radiotherapy for early breast cancer, published by Murray Brandt and colleagues on the JCO on July 2020. The FAST trial evaluated the normal tissue effects, the NTE and disease outcomes of five-fraction regimens for as whole breast radiation as compared to standard fractionation regimens. These update reports the five-year results for changing photographic breast appearance and physician assessment for breast normal tissue effects up to 10 years after radiation therapy, and this is the trial design. This is a multicenter phase three randomized controlled trial for patients aged more than 50 years, uh, pathologic tumor size less than three centimeters, axillary node negative, breast conservative surgery, and whole breast radiation indication. Patients were uh, randomly assigned to receive 20, uh, 50 gray in 25 fractions uh, or uh, 30 gray in five once weekly fractions of six gray or 28.5 gray in five once weekly fractions of 5.7 gray. Um, results the NTE in terms of shrinkage, in duration, edema, teleangiectasia. Most prevalent individual effect was breast shrinkage. The five-year prevalence of any moderate breast NTE was estimated to be 10% higher for the 30 gray versus the 50 gray, with no statistically significant difference between 28.5 gray and 50 gray. No statistical significant differences between scheduling five-year prevalence of marked moderate breast in duration telangiectasia, breast edema, nor in 10 years prevalence of any moderate marked effects. Um, or risk uh, for any moderate marked physician assessed breast NTE was uh, uh, two for the 30 gray and 1.2 for the 28.5 gray as compared to 50 uh, gray group. At 10 years, there was no significant difference in NTE rates of the 28.5 gray in five fractions as compared to the 50 gray in 25 fractions. 
but the NTE were higher uh, for the 30 gray in five fractions SAR. So these are the main conclusions of the others, although not powerful tumor control as an exploratory endpoint, the FAST trial, 10 year results, confirmed the published three years findings that a once weekly five fraction schedule for 28 gray has whole radiation could be identified that appears to be radiobiologically comparable in terms of NTE to a conventionally fractionated regimen. But the most important uh, trial published in 2020 about hyperfractionation is the fast forward trial. Hyperfractionated breast radiotherapy for one week as compared to three weeks, five year efficacy and late normal tissue effects results from this trial published by Murray Brandt and colleagues on May 2020. Uh, the aim to identify if this five fraction, so ultra hyperfractionation radiation therapy delivered in one week was non inferior, inferior in terms of local can cancer control and safe as the international standard of care 15 fraction regimen after primary surgery for early breast cancer. Uh, patients PT13, PN01, M0 after breast conservation surgery uh, or mastectomy were eligible and randomized to receive either uh, 40 gray in 15 fractions uh, or 27 gray in 5 fractions of 5.4 gray per fraction or 26 gray in 5 fractions uh, of 5.2 gray per fraction. This is the primary endpoint. These are uh, outstanding results in terms of hazard ratio, in terms of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence, uh, 40 gray. Uh, uh, in 50 fraction as compared to uh, 27 grain 5 fraction 0 0.86 uh, and as compared to 26 grain 5 fraction 0 0.67. Uh, uh, therefore, the non inferiority could be claimed for both 5 fraction schedules. As secondary endpoints, uh, uh, incidence of local regional relapse, distant metastasis, uh, therefore, disease free survival and overall survival were similar between groups with no statistically significant difference. In terms of cosmetic assessment, uh, NTE and photographic uh, poor results uh, was, uh, uh, were shown for the 27 gray group as compared to the 40 gray group, but not significant difference between the 26 gray and the 40 gray groups. These are the main uh, conclusions, uh, a five year uh, local relapse instance after a one week course of adjuvant breast radiotherapy delivered in five fractions was non inferior to the standard three weeks uh, uh, schedule according to these predefined inferiority uh, thresholds. The 26 grain five fractions dose level was uh, indeed similar to the 40 grain 15 fractions in terms of patients assess normal tissue effects, clinician, clinician assess normal tissue effects, photographic change in breast appearance, and it was similar to the normal tissue effects expected after a 46, 48 gray into gray per fraction. Uncertainty uh, uh, remains about biological processes, which include a time factor in, in fast forward that does not interfere uh, with clinical evaluation and decisions on the implementation of fast forward results in similar patient group. And this uh, five fraction regimen is also relevant in terms of partial breast radiation after specific phase three uh, trials. But this year, another gay trial on hyperfractionation was the IFO trial um, published on November 2020 on the Journal of Clinical Oncology by the Danish group uh, led by Birgit Offersen and, uh, and colleagues. Uh, the aim of the IFO trial was to determine whether a dose of 40 40 gray in 15 fractions uh, uh, does not increase the occurrence of breast in duration at three years as compared to uh, 50 gray in 25 fractions. This is a, a multicenter phase three randomized non inferiority trial for patients aged more than 40 years who uh, underwent breast conserving surgery without immediate reconstruction for early breast cancer or ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast requiring radiation therapy to the residual breast only. And the group were uh, randomized one to one to receive 50 gray in 25 fractions or 40 gray in 15 fractions. Uh, the primary endpoint was breast irradiation. Secondary endpoints were telangiectasia, dysmetis, pigmentation, 
scar appearance uh, and edema. The results, as you can see, the three year rate of uh, grade two, three in duration was almost 12% in the 50 grade group and 9% in the 40 grade group. And the upper threshold uh, of the uh, confidence interval for the difference in incidence uh, satisfied the statistical criteria for non inferiority. During the five year evaluation, the overall in duration risk was 15% in the 50 grade group and 11% in the 40 grade group. At nine year, the overall survival rate was uh, the same. In both, group, in both groups, 93.4%. And therefore, the main conclusions of this trial that a moderate hypervaccination schedule uh, for breast radiation therapy at a dose of 40 grade and 50 fractions for early breast cancer and ductal carcinoma in situ does not increase the risk of breast morbidity irrespective of the use of chemotherapy, uh, anti-air2 uh, treatment, aromatase inhibitors, or radiation boost, and breast size. All of cosmetic outcomes were similar or better after 40 gray of radiation therapy as compared to the conventional fractionated uh, regimen. And uh, brand news from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2020 uh, is coming uh, from the phase three trial from the big 307 drug uh, 7.1 trial, a randomized phase three study of radiation doses and fractionation in low risk DCS of the breast. The main conclusions presented by Bon Chua just uh, at the end of this week that a tumor bed boost following low-burst radiation significantly reduced local relapse in patients with non-low risk DCS treated with conservative surgery, statistically independent of low breast fractionation. Uh, a main message, again, no difference in terms of local relapse uh, rate between conventional low breast radiation and hyperfractionated low breast irradiation. A tumor bed boost for DCS is still an open question but no question about the standard of care of at least moderate hyperfractionation also for DCIS. And now coming to partial breast irradiation issue, another important year 2020 also for partial breast irradiation. A very debated trial presented and published by the group of AIDIA on the JAMA Oncology Journal on July 2020 is the update of the target A randomized clinical trial on the group of patients that receive delayed target intraoperative radiation therapy as compared to wool breast uh, radiotherapy. Uh, the aim of the trial is to determine whether a delayed second procedure uh, intraoperative radiotherapy was not inferior to wool breast radiation in terms of local control and um, patients were Randomized uh, uh, age more than 45 years with invasive ductal breast carcinoma smaller than um, 35 millimeters and received delayed target uh, uh, yard uh, perform for a dose of 20 gray to tumor bed delivered with a low 20 kilovolt low energy X rays. Um, results at a five year complete follow up. The local recurrence rates were as follow target your 4% as compared to external beam radiation therapy, 1%, giving a difference of 3%, which cross the non-inferiority margin of 2.5%. Therefore, this is a negative trial. And these are the conclusion, non-inferiority or delayed target was not demonstrated although there was no statistically significant decrease in terms of secondary endpoints as mastectomy-free survival, distant disease-free survival, and lower survival. In the autos view, uh, this delayed approach uh, could be uh, handy for logistical uh, reason. However, I invite you to read this crucial commentary published on Target A by Soren Benson, Joe Ebland, and Jon uh, Yarnold on the JAMA journal on August 2020. And they uh, stated that the delayed target uh, yard, as stated by the authors, is not non-inferior and actually significantly inferior compared to external beam radiation therapy with a five years local recurrent rates reported of 3.96% as compared 
uh, delayed target yield showed a five years local recurrence rate uh, basically comparable to the no radiation therapy arm um, reported in the prime trial as comparable were results from the respective external beam radiation therapy arms in both uh, trials. Imbalances in non-cancer related deaths are long gone and so uh, is the target your spare or potentially fatal adverse events caused by external beam radiation therapy. But however, warning uh, flags were there uh, already in the statistical analysis of the original publication from the target A trial. So therefore, it's really an open uh, debated uh, uh, trial. But uh, concerning the intraoperative radiotherapy, I invite you to read the astro ECROP recommendation for intraoperative radiation therapy using electrons, so EOERT in breast cancer, published in the Green Journal in 2020. There is a nice literature evidence review um, comparing uh, uh, intraoperative electron radiation therapy as accelerated partial breast irradiation um, and patient selection, eligibility criteria results as a combination of uh, APBI guidelines. Uh, uh, and astro and astro criteria. The preoperative assessment must include determined clinical staging and exclude multicentricity. Age and comorbidities uh, must also be considered. And the subsequent selection was made during surgery and is based on the pathology, pathology results in the specimens, frozen section, including histologic type, resection margins, and presence of metastasis in the center of the node. And again, is published also the evidence on the yurt uh, as uh, tumor bed boost. This is coming from a pool analysis performed by the uh, European group of the International Society of Intraoperative Radiation Therapy, the Easy Earth Europe, where single boost doses preceded standard wall breast radiation using a 50 uh, gray uh, regimen. Uh, higher local relapse rates were described for grade 3 tumors, triple negative breast cancer for patients treated after primary systemic therapy for locally advanced tumors. So again, one of the crucial points in terms of accelerated partial breast radiation or use of intraoperative radiotherapy as a boost is patient selection. So eligible patients are those with histologically confirmed invasive breast cancer, clinical stage one to three, with no limits to the kind of systemic treatment, age, molecular subtype, tumor sites, and other status when it, it used uh, as a boost. That's a very important paper. And very important to um, uh, show the difference between the uh, distinct approach as partial breast irradiation techniques. This is a, a report that we published on uh, uh, Repract Oncology Radiotherapy Journal, showing that several types of partial breast irradiation are demonstrated to be nowadays equivalent to breast irradiation, but they cannot be considered equal among themselves as physical radiation therapy properties are different for each PBI technique, influencing significantly dose distribution, irradiated volumes, dose homogeneity, and skin uh, doses. Uh, basically, two basic principles are behind partial breast radiation. Inadequate patient selection, low-risk breast cancer patients with low postoperative uh, ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence rates, accurate dose delivery to the target volume, and the patient selection. As we all agree with the main guidelines that female patients aged more than 50 years, PT1, unifocal, grade one, two, non-lobular, non-DCS, and negative surgical margins, luminal-like, and uninvolved lymph nodes are suitable patients for our uh, routine practice. And again, in 2020, uh, the accelerated partial breast radiation uh, APBI MRT Florence trial has been uh, published on the Journal of Clinical uh, Oncology. This is uh, a small but single center phase three trial uh, published. Uh, um, comparing accelerated external accelerated partial breast irradiation using an intensity modulated radiation therapy as compared to conventionally fractionated 50 gray in 25 fractions uh, wall breast uh, irradiation. Main results uh, long term at a median follow up of 10 years, uh, the 10 year uh, incidence of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence was uh, uh, less than 3% percent in the wall breast irradiation and 3.7 percent in accelerated partial breast arm with no significant uh, difference. No difference also in terms of the overall survival, 
breast cancer specific survival or contralateral breast cancer incidence. Uh, most important, the accelerated partial breast irradiation given in five uh, fractions show significantly less acute toxicity and late toxicity and an improved cosmetic outcome as evaluated by both physician and patient reported outcomes. And I invite you to have a look to this very nice uh, commentary uh, by Jen Wright and uh, Jennifer Bellon published in the uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology. Is this the right time for five fraction partial breast irradiation? This commentary taking account that the Florence uh, Rapid and SABP B39 and the import low trials all demonstrated that in selected low risk patients, uh, confining external beam radiotherapy to the surgical bed and the surrounding normal tissue margin results uh, demonstrate a similar ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence uh, rates as compared to whole breast radiation approach. Uh, this optimal patient selection and dose fractionation is, is less clear, but is, we are moving forward. The Florence trial uses a uh, five fraction every other day regimen. It uh, seemed to be more convenient and feasible, but a head to head comparison of various PBI regimens are still uh, necessary, as some patients may value long term cosmetic outcome over convenience. The next phase will be tailored selection of patients uh, receiving radiation and treatment technique to the patient uh, considering individual ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence risk unique anatomy and uh, preferences. And now we come to another important uh, uh, issue that is the optimization of treatments uh, in a very low risk patients group. This is, is a very nice work uh, published by Matthew Ward and colleagues uh, on the breast cancer research and treatment of 2020 about the cost effectiveness analysis of endocrine therapy alone as compared to partial breast irradiation alone combined uh, versus combined treatment for low risk or more positive early stage breast cancer in women aged 70 years or older. This is the design of the study um, and uh, taking account of population over 200,000 patients simulated uh, from the uh, CalGB9343 inclusion criteria, age 70 or more, uh, with estrogen positive uh, invasive breast cancer of two centimeters or less uh, undergoing uh, a breast conserving surgery. And in a base case analysis, uh, aromatase inhibitors was comparable but slightly superior in terms of efficacy and slightly less expensive over the lifetime of the average patient that received an accelerated partial breast irradiation. The combination therapy did not meet the quality and cost, effectiveni cost effectiveness thresholds. But in the scenario analysis of non-compliance with endocrine, endocrine therapy that we know are approximately 25%, the accelerated partial breast irradiation alone strategy became more effective than the aromatase inhibitors alone strategy. That's all, therefore, uh, the author's uh, uh, conclusions uh, that the comparable outcomes with the three strategy uh, exist uh, that aromatase inhibitors alone was the, at le the least expensive option, although the absolute difference in cost as compared to accelerated partial breast alone was uh, minimal. And the combined approach was associated with an increased cost with marginal difference in terms of uh, qualities. Uh, late shift in cost for quality was seen in relation to change in rate of clinical outcomes toxicities, the use of expensive additional therapies, uh, as for example, by phosphonates, uh, or in patients at risk having a greater toxicity related to aromatase inhibitors, uh, and all history of stopenia, osteoporosis, uh, in that cases, uh, an accelerated partial breast radiation approach might be uh, preferred. Uh, this analysis was based on uh, the Florence trial MRT technique, which is more costly than a theoretic three-dimensional uh, conformal radiation therapy uh, technique, which may dominate an aromatase uh, inhibitors therapy in cost uh, uh, terms. Uh, the minor differences between uh, aromatase inhibitors and partial based radiation warrant 
uh, prospective trials. And the prospective trial uh, is going to start uh, at the beginning of 2021. 20, uh, it is the Europa uh, trial uh, comparing exclusive endocrine therapy or partial breast radiation in very low risk patients aged more than 70 years old affected by uh, luminal A like early stage breast uh, cancer. On the Journal of Geriatric Oncology has been published the proof of concept uh, of this uh, uh, interesting uh, trial, a phase three randomized trial with uh, uh, two uh, primary endpoints, uh, the local relapse at five years and the impact of health related quality of life using uh, a patient reporting uh, reported outcome measures. And uh, several trials uh, are nowadays uh, ongoing, um, aiming uh, to the identification of patients where an optimization rather than the escalation of treatment uh, is uh, appropriate. All these published studies uh, investigating this subset of patients uh, with uh, uh, frailty were designed and performed in order to evaluate always radiation therapy omission without uh, evaluating uh, the omission of the systemic treatment. So we will see results uh, over the next years. Very important about uh, an omission and uh, optimization of treatment uh, coming from San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2020 is the update of the prime to study presented by Ian uh, Kunkler. Here, the main conclusions. Uh, at um, a 10 years update, uh, this trial comparing uh, patients aged more than 65 years uh, to comp to receive endocrine therapy plus radiation therapy as compared to uh, endocrine therapy only, show a 9.8% of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence risk at 10 years with the omission of postoperative wall breast radiation for patients with T1, 2, PN0, HR positive um, biology uh, as compared to uh, patients receiving endocrine therapy and radiation therapy that have a 0.9% of 10 year relapse. Most deaths in this population were not due to breast cancer. Uh, others concluded that omission of postoperative radiotherapy is a reasonable option for these patients. Again, I would like to show you the results in the cohort of patients with low estrogen receptor uh, uh, status that have a local relapse risk at 10 years of almost 20%. And finally, just an update on the oligometastatic disease after publication of the comet Saber trial by the group led by David Palma, I would like to uh, invite to uh, read the characterization and classification of oligometastatic disease at the initiative of the European Society for Radiation Therapy and Oncology at the European Organi Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer Consensus on the oligometastatic uh, disease. Since there is lack of a uh, biomarker metastatic disease identification, imaging only may overlap different setting. The aim of this work was to establish a comprehensive system of oligometastatic disease uh, characterization factors to reach uh, an agreement. Uh, um, the methods, uh, factors for oligometastatic disease characterization were defined in a two-step process uh, and a Delphi consensus uh, process. Uh, first, a systematic literature review uh, concerning prospective phase one to three uh, trial, an independent uh, uh, selection uh, about relevant uh, and study inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria, and then um, a Delphi process with a threshold of consensus of 75% that led to a decision tree and an oligometastatic definition disease uh, uh, states. Very interesting. Uh, all the classification are based on five simple questions uh, uh, from the imaging-based diagnosis of the oligometastatic disease uh, to the synchronous or uh, metachronous uh, uh, characterization. And uh, uh, these are the main uh, conclusions that the oligometastatic disease is and remains 
a complex dynamic state where several courses of systemic and local therapy might really transfer one patient from one state to another several times during his cancer history, different goals and therapeutic strategies can be chosen depending on the patient oligometastatic disease state and using uh, the, this classification could be really a definitive decision-making tools uh, uh, but uh, is still to be established. In the context of clinical trials, uh, the harmonized oligometastatic disease characterization system will uh, contribute to a better understanding and interpretation of the study results and facilitate cross-study comparisons as well as uh, uh, meta-analysis, pool analysis, and systematic reviews. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, testing these states of oligometastatic disease in a project that is ongoing is the oligocare prospective cohort uh, uh, trial by the OTC and Destro uh, societies will for sure help to assess the prognostic value and their accept acceptance and compliance in uh, our routine uh, practice. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Please do not hesitate to contact me in case, and we will see what 2021 will uh, give us in our, in our fantastic uh, disease and work. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to join us tomorrow for day four of the best of 2020 in ovarian cancer, immunotherapies, sarcomas, lymphomas, and liquid biopsies. Great presenters like Dr. Don Deason, Dr. John Hannon, Dr. Jonathan Trent, Dr. Raul Cordoba, and Dr. Christian Rolfo. Remember that regardless of geography, we're all on Go Alert.